his ability to run his campaign. And secondly, I don't understand how this indictment gets Trump a single new vote in a general election. This indictment and potentially future indictments make Trump seem even more chaotic than we've already known him to be and the chaos that surrounds him. And so while this may help Trump secure the Republican nomination, if it doesn't end up interfering, if the indictments keep coming, I think this is bad for Trump in a general election. That's my view as of today. If the facts change, I will revise that view. Check this out. Steve Ducey on Fox News tried to add a little bit of common sense to the discussion this morning on Fox and Friends about why lawyer uh, lawyers in general are able to give testimony that is being used in the prosecution of Donald Trump. And really, they're talking about Michael Cohen, because one of the things that the right has started to harp on is how do you force lawyers to break attorney client privilege? How is it Michael Cohen is somehow being used to provide evidence against Trump when he was Trump's lawyer? There's a very simple explanation. It's called the crime fraud exception. Steve Ducey tries to explain it to his co-hosts. They don't want to hear it. When you try to insert fact on Fox and Friends, you aren't rewarded. So I think there's a lot to fight here. And in the back of my mind in watching all this, is we could be doing this three more times. Yeah, we could be doing it with the January 6. Uh -huh. Let's hope we could be doing Georgia. it with the Georgia situation and we could do it with Mar-a-Lago, Mar which is heating up like you wouldn't believe. They are now making Secret Service right. testify. They make his own attorney, uh, 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 Corcoran. He right. has to testify his own client. Well, what if, is it? If, Jack Smith is uh, is somehow rocket fuel to get uh, Trump in a way that I don't I can't believe people aren't challenging this and saying, even if I don't like Donald Trump, right. what's going on here? Because of the crime, we've talked about this, the crime fraud um, exemption. If if you get legal advice during the execution of a crime, but it your attorney never happens. Crips, your, your, it happens more than it, you would believe. Talk to Mark Levin about that. Your attorney <laughs> uh, client privilege goes out the window. Regarding the Secret Service, how many see, times does it happen? Ludicrous. It's nuts. No, I, you have an attorney <laughs> and. So, two arguments. First, they're ignoring the crime fraud exception. Then Brian Kilmeade moves to, well, how often has it actually happened? We're going to address all of these points in a moment. Secret uh, Service, I, and you flip them? I am just talking about what is the law. That is the law. It's rarely so th used. That is, so well, it was used in this case. No the other kidding. thing is, if the, I feel like it's uh, open to mic night, I'm getting uh, heckle over here. No, uh, I'm not heckling you. I'm just saying no, it's no, so no. ludicrous yeah. that no, you no, can no, tell I'm your just attorney saying, I, you're. Okay. So Ainsley Earhart is saying it's ludicrous. Brian Kilmeade is saying it's ridiculous. And Steve Ducey is absolutely correct about lawyers testifying and the crime fraud exception. It's not controversial and it actually has been used many times. So the crime fraud exception is a legal principle which allows certain confidential communications, like, for example, those between an attorney and their client to be disclosed in court. It's time for Nicole Sandler. What's news from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Let's begin today with the huge news that's likely being overshadowed by coverage of the former guy's arraignment on Tuesday, which we'll get to. But first, Tuesday was a damn good day for progressives. Voters went to the polls in two runoff elections. In Chicago, progressive Brandon Johnson emerged the winner in the mayoral race against more conservative Paul Vallis. And in Wisconsin, where control of the state Supreme Court was at stake, the liberal judge, Janet Protasiewicz, easily beat her conservative opponent, Daniel Kelly, in that Wisconsin Supreme Court race, moving the court's control to the left, just as they prepare to hear an important abortion case. Oh, and take up redistricting in the state. You see, all Democrats need to do is just show up and vote. Now, on to the main attraction. The lead in the New York Times today reads... Donald J. Trump, who has weathered two impeachment trials, a special counsel inquiry, and decades of investigations, was accused by Manhattan prosecutors on Tuesday of orchestrating a hush money scheme to pave his path to the presidency and then covering it up from the White House. Yeah, history was made on Tuesday. For the first time, a standing or former president was arraigned. Donald Trump was charged with 34 felony counts 
for allegedly falsifying business records. Now, the case is largely connected to that 2016 hush money payment to former porn star Stormy Daniels, though two other deals were also invoked. The one involving Karen McDougal. Do you remember her, the former Playboy model who was paid $150,000 to keep quiet about an alleged long-term affair? And then there was the case of Dino Sajudin. He's a doorman who was paid $30,000 to keep quiet about a story of a Donald Trump love child that apparently later turned out to be fake anyway. It appears that the two main witnesses for the prosecution are the unfortunately named David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, who worked with Trump by lining up these catch-and-kill stories where they'd purchase the rights to negative stories about Trump and then make sure they were never published. And, of course, Michael Cohen, Trump's ex-lawyer and fixer, who went to prison for perjury and tax fraud charges related to these very charges. So Trump arrived at the courthouse. It was a media circus, more media than protesters or counter-protesters combined because our media hasn't learned the lessons. So after the hearing, the cameras, of course, followed Trump and his caravan back to LaGuardia Airport and then back to Florida to Mar-a-Lago. Once at Mar-a-Lago, Trump had promoted that he was going to deliver remarks. According to reports, it was the typical Trump stump speech, except more boring than usual. But apparently, Trump spent 30 minutes trashing all of the investigations he faces. Again, he attacked the judge on this case, Juan Merchan, despite Merchan's admonition to both sides that everyone tied to the criminal case refrained from any comments that undermine the rule of law. But Trump called Merchan, quote, a Trump-hating judge with a Trump-hating wife and family whose daughter worked for Kamala Harris of the Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg, Trump said he, quote, should be prosecuted or at a minimum he should resign for illegally leaking vast amounts of grand jury information. God, he's delusional. And about the case in general, Trump said, quote, this fake case was brought only to interfere with the upcoming 2024 election and should be dropped immediately. There is no case, no case. Sure, Donald, eat another cheeseburger. Of the special counsel, Jack Smith, who was overseeing both the federal classified documents and the January 6th probes, Trump alleged Jack Smith is a made up name. And he said he's a, quote, radical left lunatic known as a bomb thrower who is harassing hundreds of my people day after day over the boxes hoax. What? He called the district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, Fannie Willis, a, quote, local racist district attorney in Atlanta, who's doing everything in her power to indict me over an absolutely perfect phone call. Yeah, it was a perfect criminal phone call in which he tried to entice Georgia's secretary of state to fix the results of the election there and declare him the winner. Of New York, Attorney General Letitia James, who's suing the Trumps and the Trump Organization, He said she is, quote, another racist in reverse. Wow. And so it went. Most of the news channels that even bothered to cover it cut away. So what happens next? Well, Trump is free. The judge set the next hearing in this case for December 4th, though in the wake of the comments Trump made about the judge, his family, his daughter specifically, perhaps they'll call them back into court and institute that gag order or not. I guess we'll wait and find out. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. Two very telling races overnight. Let's start in Wisconsin, where liberal judge Janet Protasevich has now overturned and flipped control of the state's conservative Supreme Court. Is this cr- is a big win for abortion rights and could mean that the court could overturn the state's abortion ban. They could also end ger- the use of gerrymandered legislative maps, which have given Republicans commanding control of the state's legislature. Now, state Supreme Court races like this don't usually garner this kind of national attention, but this race is having a huge huge impact on the future of a very key battleground state. And Robin, it did become the most expensive judicial race in American mm. history with more than $40 million spent. $40 million? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's go back to Chicago for a m- moment. The the race for mayor there, it was Democrat against Democrat. So yep. what's the takeaway from last night, Mary? 
The big takeaway is that this is a very big victory for progressives. Brandon Johnson, of a union organizer, former teacher, is now set to become Chicago's next mayor. This was a close race, but Johnson had the backing of the teachers union. He was promising to invest in schools and social programs, and he was also vowing to address the root causes of crime in the city where his opponent uh, was promising to add additional police force. Yes, uh, this was uh, really fascinating uh, yesterday. Thank you, Wisconsin, for showing up, but uh, not so much to the Milwaukee suburbs. The northern suburbs of Mil- of Milwaukee, okay, decided to put in another Republican in a special election in the state legislature in the state of Wisconsin, giving the state of Wisconsin Senate a supermajority by which they can now flex and impeach the woman you just voted to be the new Supreme Court justice. Uh, What a tangled uh, web uh, these conservatives weave. Uh, So you got the front uh, attack, okay? You got the front, uh, you know, entryway right. You got that, uh, you know, uh, uh, assertive sort of a uh, uh, a vote done yesterday, but uh, you, I told you, I told you that uh, you know Milwaukee, Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin is a swing state. It is 50-50, right? It's 50 percent uh, Democrat, 50 percent Republican, and the suburbs of in northern Milwaukee are, uh, you know, very Republican, very red. And that is the district, District 8 in uh, Wisconsin, that had to select an in an open seat, uh, you know, a, 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 a senator. And they chose the conservative uh, freak. They, they Remember that I was talking about yesterday, the, the guy Knoodle? You chose Knoodle. And Knoodle said, yes, uh, you know, I, I'm not interested in impeaching the governor, Tony Evers, because he's a Democrat, right? So therefore, you know, uh, they're in the, he, Tony Evers is in their sights only because he's a Democratic governor. So he said, well, I, I'm not so interested in impeaching Tony Evers, but, you know, um, Janet, maybe I would. Maybe I would impeach uh, the new Supreme Court justice and maybe I would impeach, uh, you know, uh, the uh, attorney general and maybe I would impeach the district attorney in Milwaukee, John Chisholm, and maybe I would uh, actually, uh, you know, impeach uh, some other people I don't like. And, you know, Brett said, well, don't they have to have a reason to impeach? Well, you know, uh, legitimately, yes. Uh, technically, no. But they're saying soft on crime, soft on crime. So now the Wisconsin legislature has a super majority, meaning enough to override any veto by the governor of any damn thing, including abortion, election maps, uh, you know, uh, redistricting, everything, right? Uh, The manner in which you select your electors. Yes, the Senate has a super majority and they can override the veto of the governor. With their new supermajority, I think there's 33 seats in Wisconsin Senate, and 22 of them now, or, or 23 of them now, are in the hands of Republicans. In the Assembly, in the House, in uh, Wisconsin's legislature, you're two seats shy of having a supermajority there, and you would need a supermajority in both houses to override a veto of the governor. But congratulations, Wisconsin! You, you know, you just took a perfectly, you know, a uh, uh, a battleground state, a perfectly divided swing state where everybody got a say. And you just, uh, you know, through these gerrymandered maps, handed a super majority uh, to the Republicans who can undo all the good that you did. So I don't want to, you know, uh, piss on your parade because, uh, you know, Dan Kelly was so, Dan Kelly was who uh, Janet. Pro, pro, I can't say her name. I, I, I think it's pro to say what's uh, Janet pro to say what's is now uh, she has just tilted the Supreme Court. It was uh, four to three conservative. Now it's four to three, uh, you know, not conservative, whatever, you know, moderate. Uh, But so she made her little uh, acceptance speech yesterday and she said, listen, Wisconsinites voted and they had their voice heard, right? Today's results mean two very important and special things. First, it means that Wisconsin voters have made their voices heard. They've chosen to reject partisan extremism in this state. And second, it means our democracy will always prevail. Too many have tried to overturn the will of the people. Today's results show that Wisconsinites believe in democracy and the democratic process. 
Well, I mean, I understand why uh, she's taking a victory lap. It was a hard-fought campaign. There's no doubt about it. And uh, the the person that she was running against had already, uh, you know, been a Supreme Court justice. Uh, I think he was he 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 did his ten years. Uh, and through those 10 years, people complained about him. Uh, they they told uh, people who were voting for a new seat, uh, for a new justice, that this guy was a, a problem. And uh, people sort of rejected him. But he didn't want, he wasn't having any of it. The, the guy's name is uh, Dan Kelly. You don't have to remember his name because you probably never hear from him again. But uh, here's Dan Kelly saying, you know, I really wish my opponent was worthy of a concession, but she's not. Now, this didn't turn out the way that we were looking for. And I think there are, there are a couple of reasons for it, and I think we need to address them head on. And it brings me no joy to say this. I wish that in a circumstance like this, I would be able to concede to a worthy opponent. Oh, my God. But I do not have a worthy opponent to which I can concede. This was the most deeply deceitful, dishonorable, despicable campaign I have ever seen run for the courts. It was truly beneath contempt. <laughs> now I say this not because we did not prevail. Yeah, right. I do not say this because of the rancid slanders that were launched against me. Rancid. Although that was bad enough. But that is not my concern. My concern is the damage done to the institution of the court. <laughs> my opponent is a serial liar. Oh, my God. She's disregarded judicial ethics. She's demeaned the judiciary with her behavior. And this is the future that we have to look forward to in Wisconsin. You dodged a bullet, Wisconsin. I, I don't know, Randy. He seems like an even-keeled, classy kind of guy that <laughs> yeah, should be on any court. Yeah, keep it classy. Keep it classy, Super Kelly. classy, dude. He lost by 10 points. I mean, it wasn't even close, okay? It really wasn't. And now the uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court is, uh, you know, four to three uh, majority, not conservative. He was uh, part of that conservative block, but... Listen, I, the, the, the Supreme Court in Wisconsin is going to have to decide whether a law from 1849 regarding a woman's right to privacy in her own person uh, stands. You can bet that that will not stand. Uh, the gerrymandered legislative maps, uh, the election administration, meaning whether or not you actually will have elections in Wisconsin. Because, you know, each state chooses the manner in which each state selects the slate of electors. Now, I'm telling you right now, you got a problem in your, uh, in your, in your legislature Wisconsin. You got you got a serious problem there. And uh, I just know that you're going to have to pay a lot of attention to every single bill that comes out of the House and the Senate in Wisconsin. We all will. We all have to. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Com. <laughs> I have to concede one point. Today's far-right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive, but to fill them with cheap, compliant children. Huckabee Sanders rushed to the aid of these corporate powers, eliminating a bothersome Arkansas law that had required Tyson, Walmart, and other big employers to get a special state permit to put any child under 16 to work. The meddling hand of big government creeping down from Washington, D.C., she bellowed, will be stopped cold. We will get the over-regulating, micromanaging, bureaucratic tyrants off your backs. So she is using the meddling hand of big state government to creep into the lives of vulnerable children. She is not alone. Ohio's Republican-controlled state government is moving to extend the number of hours bosses can make children work. 
Iowa wants to let 14-year-olds work in industrial freezers and laundries, and Republicans in Congress have shrunk the number of investigators and lawyers policing child labor abuse so abusive corporate managers know there is little chance they'll be caught. Most damning, these corporate politicians value children so little that they've set the maximum fine for violating the workplace safety of minors at $15,000 per child. For multi-million dollar conglomerates, that devaluation makes it much cheaper to endanger children than protect them. This is Jim Hightower saying, America should not even be talking about child safety rules in dangerous workplaces. It's shameful to have any children working there. Howdy ho, folks, and thanks for tuning in to my Hightower Radio Commentaries. And guess what? There's even more Hightower waiting for you online. Subscribers to my Substack newsletter, Jim Hightower's Lowdown, get commentaries, articles, interviews with progressive sparklies, live events, historical nuggets, and more. Go to jimhightower.substack.com to sign up, and you'll get more. That's jimhightower.substack.com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2010. That was the day an explosion in the Upper Big Branch Mine killed 29 miners. This is the second of two parts commemorating that disastrous moment in labor history. The accumulation of explosive methane gas was so pronounced that the mine had to be evacuated several times leading up to the disaster. A 126-page Governor's Independent Investigation Panel report detailed the systemic failures of safety systems and at governmental agencies charged with enforcing regulation. Lack of proper ventilation, adherence to rock dusting standards, and proper maintenance of machinery were main factors. The panel also held the Mine Safety and Health Administration responsible for disregarding the documented risk of methane out bursts at the mine, overlooking the deadly potential of a precarious ventilation system, neglecting to use its regulatory authority to force technological improvements, and allowing the U.S. mine safety system to atrophy. They determined that MSHA could have issued flagrant violation citations and had the authority to shut the mines down, but didn't. The report noted the cozy relations between mine owners, politicians, judges, and regulators. Specifically, the ease with which state mine officials move from employment with industry to government and back. Despised union-busting CEO Don Blankenship, who was tried and convicted to one year in jail. Don't give up Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Within hours of becoming the first American president to become a criminal defendant, ha! Donald Trump was on a flight back to Florida to deliver a defiant address. I never thought anything like this could happen. In America, never thought it could happen. Trump claiming the case is politically motivated and denying all wrongdoing. This fake case was brought only to interfere with the upcoming 2024 election, and it should be dropped immediately, immediately. But prosecutors say it's Trump that interfered in the 2016 election, alleging he repeatedly made hush money payments to hide personal scandals and falsified documents to cover it all up. The former president surrendered to authorities in New York hours earlier, stepping out of Trump Tower with a raised fist, waving as he stepped into his vehicle. Inside the courthouse, Trump was treated just like any other criminal defendant. Not really. Arrested, fingerprinted, and processed, but no mugshot or right. handcuffs. Right. President Trump, will you come speak to us, President Trump? Trump remaining silent until he entered the courtroom, then pleading not guilty to all 34 felony charges. Still cameras only allowed inside for just a few minutes, capturing this image. The former president at the defense table, stone-faced with his hands in his lap. Prosecutors say Trump orchestrated a criminal scheme where he repeatedly and fraudulently falsified New York business records to conceal criminal conduct that hid damaging information from the voting public during the 2016 presidential election. The catch and kill scheme. That is a scheme to buy and suppress negative information to help Mr. Trump's chance of winning the election. The indictment alleges Trump worked with his former lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen and his friend, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, to direct hush money payments to at least three people, 
The most well-known case, the $130,000 paid by Cohen to porn actress Stormy Daniels in the campaign's final days. But prosecutors allege the National Enquirer also paid $150,000 to former Playboy model Karen McDougal. Both women say they had affairs with the former president. Trump says they did not. And prosecutors allege the Enquirer promised to act as the eyes and ears for the campaign, even paying off a Trump Tower doorman who was trying to sell a story about Trump fathering a child, which the tabloid later concluded was not true. 34 false statements made to cover up other crimes. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. Okay, so, um, you know, I've spent a little time looking at uh, this entire last, what, five, six years of, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump wiggling out of uh, every, every, you know, illegal thing that he ever did. And uh, this indictment uh, does not say, and and this is this is this is the problem. And I said, you know, look, if if, if uh, the indictment comes down, and the indictment tells a story about tax fraud, and the indictment tells a story about, uh, you know. Uh, you know, uh, more than election, uh, you know, campaign uh, violations, then, you know, then let it let it rip. Right. Let, and let the chips fall where they may. Donald Trump has a chance to go to court. Donald Ch- uh, Trump has uh, the world's, uh, you know, most expensive lawyers. He's had hundreds of lawyers in his life. He's been sued hundreds of if not thousands of times he knows his way around the courtroom he is not some sweet little country mouse he uh isn't uh you know somebody who is unfamiliar with what's needed to fight charges okay um but if he if if this is only about um hush money payments if this is only about uh, you know funneling money through a law firm and michael Cohn taking out a home loan paying it to Stormy Daniels and then trying to conceal that payment, well, uh, you know, then I don't know whose side uh, Alvin Bragg is really on. But I will tell you this right now, okay? The reason why Michael Cohen was charged with the same crimes and went to jail and the reason why Donald Trump was not charged with those crimes and didn't go to jail is twofold. One, at the time that Michael Cohen was prosecuted for the same crime, the same crime. I mean, they were co-conspirators. Remember, Donald Trump in Michael Cohn's uh, indictment was individual one. There was a conspiracy. Michael Cohn went to jail. He was uh, adjudicated guilty. He actually he he, pl- he pled guilty, and uh, he was uh, you know sentenced to three years in a guilty plea in a plea deal, three years. Then COVID happened, so he did two years in Otisville, and then he was released on his own recognizance. Does anybody remember? Not on his own recognizance. He was released to house arrest because of COVID, right? And so he was placed uh, back in his apartment, but he was monitored. He couldn't leave, all these restrictions. Now, what's interesting is Michael Cohn wanted to write a book about everything that he had just been through. And the Trump organ, the Trump administration, I want to call it an organization because that was not a presidency. You understand that was that that was a uh, that was a, 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 a racketeering influence, corrupt organization that was posing as a presidential administration. But it wasn't. It was an organization and it was corrupt. So when Michael Cohen uh, said that he was going to write this book. Do you remember that Bill Barr told Michael Cohn that if he writes this book, he will go back to prison? And Michael Cohn said, I wrote the book. And they said, you're going back to prison. And they sent him back to Otisville. Does everybody remember that? I hope you do. Because that right there was the weaponization of the Department of Justice. They did that again. They did that again to John Bolton. Again, not a fan. But John Bolton wrote a book about his time in the Trump administration And the Trump administration literally prohibited uh, his book from being published at first. And Bolton had to fight the Trump organization. Yes, I'm calling it the Trump organization because it was not a a presidential administration. It was a corrupt uh, organization. They actually tried to stand in the way of John Bolton publishing his book. He just told you on a Sunday show last Sunday that that was the weaponization of the Department of Justice and that he could cite many other instances 
where the Department of Justice was weaponized. So you agree that the Justice Department was weaponized under the Trump administration? I, I, I can attest to it personally. I, I don't need to look at other stories. What we, do you mean by that? Well, when uh, uh, Trump and his lawyers in the White House and in the Justice Department brought both a civil and a criminal case against me mm, for yeah, publishing for a book, book that didn't go through the pre-publication review process, when they know that it had been cleared in mm -hmm. the regular order, that's, that is abusing the Justice Department. And there are plenty of other examples besides. Yeah, there are. And Michael Cohn is one of them, okay? He is one of the examples of the Department of Justice being weaponized against him. Now, what's really fascinating to me is that Michael Cohn pled guilty to the hush money payments, to tax fraud on the hush money payments, meaning he said that was income uh, that he got from a retainer agreement with Donald Trump. There was no retainer agreement, but he pled guilty. And he also uh, lied about, this is crazy, because hardly anybody knows this, but you'll know it now. Michael Cohn pled guilty to lying uh, to uh, DOJ about how many contacts Donald Trump actually did have with the Russian government in service of a Trump tower that Donald Trump wanted to build in Moscow? The real correct answer was 10. And Michael Cohn downplayed that on behalf of Donald Trump. That was another guilty plea that Michael Cohn entered. Com. This is Stephanie Miller, and here's what you missed. It is sort of fitting that New York is who knows him best and hates him the most <laughs> and for the <laughs> longest. So it's it's fitting, isn't it? Oh, yeah. He's already, I mean, his people are already whining about changing the venue to Staten Island. Yeah. Do they think people in Staten Island like the guy? No. Yeah. no. Nobody no. in New York likes Donald Trump. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I mean, they've seen his act. They saw his act 30 years longer than we did. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, where do you come down on the coverage? Jody and I were talking about, you know, I get people say Michael Steele and others saying, oh, this, you know, constant coverage is how we, we got here. But I have to say, I we deserve this. <laughs> we deserve every minute of his humiliation. Well, I mean, I mean well, it's it depends porn on what for we're me. covering. I mean, if we're, co if we're covering his, you know, his SUV going to the airport and his plane landing and him coming down the stairs... Although, you know, the fact that he did it without falling on his face yeah. is newsworthy, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, that's we're right back at the empty podium again. But I think we underestimate but, how much people really hate him. And Rachel Biddecoffer, I think, tweeted that people underestimate how much the American people are hungry for justice and that no one is above the law. And I, you know, I feel like. Yeah, but we're not going to. But we're not going to see that. Because we're there's going to there aren't going to be cameras in the courtroom. We're going to have to depend on the people who are covering the trial for that. It's a different, it, it's a, it's a, it, there's a level of, of, you know, and I appreciate that, that the TV people are in a tough spot. They can't ignore the guy. Right. Yeah. I mean, he is running for president. Well, uh, Nicole, he is I the thought, front runner for, for the Republican yeah. Party's nomination. And I thought Nicole but Wallace. my God, I mean, you know, here we are, you know, let's, let's, you know, I, let, I, I was watching Fox a little bit yesterday and they said, look at all the people out there. <laughs> Waving at the at President Trump as all he goes 50. to the airport. I counted 12 people. Yeah. 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 Right. Hear all this and more on the next Stephanie Miller Show. You. Yes, you. You're an independent thinker. You're a free thinker. You love facts. You love to figure out and orient yourself in the world so that you can solve your own problems. Right? Right. So you need randyroads.substack.com. Each and every day, we will put up facts for you. We will curate news that you need, news you can use, for lack of a better fun term, each and every day into your inbox, and yes, for free. All you need to do is go to randyroads.substack.com and become a subscriber for free, or if you're so inclined, get yourself a subscription. The subscription will deliver to you each and every day a commercial-free, on-demand video and audio podcast. You choose how you'd like to do your intake on the go, put in some buds, listen on the go with the audio, want to sit and watch it on a nice big screen, Get the video in your email each and every day, okay? So subscribe and never miss an episode. 
Plus, we give away a ton of free stuff, like uh, every Friday, free show. So join us at randyroads.substack.com. Become a subscriber, free or paid, but remember, all of our work is viewer supported. We don't take any corporate money. So thank you for your time and attention and for being a subscriber at randyroads.substack.com. Thanks. I'm Rick Smith. And this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2010. That was the day an explosion in the upper Big Branch mine killed 29 miners. This is the second of two parts commemorating that disastrous moment in labor history. The accumulation of explosive methane gas was so pronounced that the mine had to be evacuated several times leading up to the disaster. A 100 Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. And this is where we are right now. I have a Trump-hating judge huh. with a Trump-hating wife and family whose daughter worked for Kamala Harris and now receives money from the Biden-Harris campaign and a lot of it. Huh. Uh, so he, he literally went on TV last night and, um, you know, put out like a nice family, be ashamed if something happened to it, kind of a mob talk. Uh, and he did it across the board. He did it to the judge. He did it to the judge's wife. He did it to the judge's daughter. He did it to Le- Letitia James, who has a civil suit against him for tax fraud after the Trump organization uh, was charged and it was proven and uh, Weisselberg is sitting on Rikers Island in a plea deal, in a plea deal, 17 counts of tax fraud uh, from the Trump organization. So Donald Trump's bookkeeper is sitting on Rikers Island uh, after being convicted of, uh, you know, and, and, and entering into a plea deal there, right? And he's uh, screaming that Letitia James is a racist. Fannie Willis in uh, Georgia, she's a racist. That his phone call to Georgia was a perfect phone call. His, there's more than one phone call to Georgia. Uh, there was a phone call that we all know that got real famous real fast because it was, uh, it was, it was dead to rights, Donald Trump trying to fix an election. Uh, because that's all Donald Trump knows how to do is fix things. He knows how to, uh, you know, cheat. He knows how to defraud. He knows how to lie. He knows how to steal. That's Donald Trump's forte. And there are people in this country that admire that, admire that. They want a president who's going to lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, they, they really do. They think that that makes him strong. It makes him anti-democratic. It makes him illiberal. And I mean, like, anti-democratic. Not, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that democracy doesn't work for him. Rule of law doesn't work for him. So, you know, this is what he does. He stood there last night. He attacked Alvin Bragg. He said that Alvin Bragg was a criminal. Alvin Bragg needs to go to jail. Came out today. Everybody said, this is not really an indictment. There's nothing here. My lawyers came to me and they said, there's nothing here. They're not even saying what you did. The criminal is the district attorney because he illegally leaked massive amounts of grand jury information. What? For which he should be prosecuted (laughs) or at a minimum he should resign. And Alvin Bragg's wife confirmed a report that claimed her husband has Trump nailed on felonies. She has since locked down her Twitter account. Okay, so not just Alvin Bragg, but Alvin Bragg's wife, too, has to be denigrated, has to be mentioned as a problem, has to be mentioned as somebody who needs targeting, okay? Alvin Bragg, Alvin Bragg's wife. The, 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 tr- the judge, Judge Marchand, not just Judge Marchand, but Judge Marchand's wife. Not just Judge Marchand's wife, but Judge Marchand's daughter, okay? They all have to be targeted. They all have to be... Uh, somebody that has a bullseye, you know, crosshairs drawn around them. Now, I don't know how long Donald Trump is going to last uh, before the judge calls him back in and says to him, you either tone it down, buddy boy, and stop threatening people's families, including mine, or you're not going to await trial on your own. You're going to await trial on Rikers next to your bookkeeper there. 
I don't I don't know how long. I, I will tell you that the next time that Donald Trump has, so far is ordered to court is December the 4th. December the 4th. That is the next time you will hear anything about this, okay? And so that means that the trial, <laughs> if, if, if they can't delay it uh, even longer, if they can't make uh, spurious motions, if they can't, uh, you know, claim this or that, or, 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 or somehow gum up the works, that the trial of Donald Trump for uh, uh, felonies, 34 felonies, not misdemeanors of, you know, uh, uh, jerking around with the business records, not just lying on your ledgers, but that he entered into a conspiracy Okay, a conspiracy to uh, affect the results of an election, okay, with Pecker and with, uh, uh, you know, Michael Cohen uh, and, uh, you know, that he was doing this and violating tax laws. And, and, and we know that Bragg doesn't need to prove that he cheated on his taxes because it's already been proven that he cheated on his taxes. It's already proven that his organization for which he is the CEO was uh, found guilty 17 different times for tax fraud. Now, Bragg doesn't need to go retry that case. He just needs to show the result of that case to prove that Donald Trump's intent was to defraud the American people, that we didn't have a right to know what Donald Trump's character was. And Donald Trump decided that he didn't want us to know that he paid off uh, porn stars, that he paid off a mistress. He didn't want us to know that he entered into a conspiracy with David Pecker at uh, the National Enquirer. After the Access Hollywood tape came out, he didn't know whether he was going to win or lose the election based on our judgment of him on the Access Hollywood tape. It turned out that Republicans didn't hold it against him that uh, he was saying out loud that he could molest women. They kind of thought it was a plus. But you have to remember Donald Trump didn't pay Stormy Daniels. He didn't actually send the payments to her until after he won the election. Because he wasn't sure if he would. And if he did, if he didn't, he wasn't going to pay her. Because who the hell would care what you thought of him? So that's interesting. But, you know, uh, listen, I got, I got to tell you that uh, people are sitting there and they're saying, this indictment, uh, the the... The statement of facts, which is not the indictment, the statement of facts, the story that it told was a really disgusting, dark, dank story of a man with absolutely no morals, no character, uh, no, 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 no conscience, nothing. OK, and that he was going to f I mean, listen, the, the, the idea that he could have written her a check and given it to her and said, uh, you know, sign this NDA and that will be the end of it. That was totally something he could have done, but he didn't. He didn't. He had to funnel it through Michael Cohen. And to, to uh, there's tape of him saying to Michael Cohen, wash my hands, make my hands clean. I mean, it's sick. And Michael, Co he said, so what do you want, cash? And Michael said, no, 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 no. We're going to talk to our friend David, who we now know as David Pecker at AMI, and we're going to get him to pay off one. And then I'm going to take care of the other one. And I'm going to, and he said, well, go talk to Alan and find out how we do it. Instead of just writing her a check, right? So we don't have to prove anything more than what's uh, in, this, in the uh, indictment. What we have to show is intent to commit these felonies. And you already have that. Now, this is just the very first case. And I'm telling you right now, is this the crime of the century? No, no, it's not the crime of the century. It's a character crime is what it is. It's a felony, but it's a crime that shows you the character of this man. He doesn't have any. He didn't want you to know who he was. He didn't want you to know what he was doing. He didn't want you to know. He was, and he wasn't afraid of, of uh, what turned out to be MAGA. He was afraid of moderates. He was afraid of losing independence. He was afraid that, you know, women would, uh, you know, think that he had a pattern and practice of paying women off after he had used them or abused them. And that was the truth. That's what he did, too. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. 
Referring to Trump, Carlson says, I hate him passionately. I hate him passionately. We are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. So there it is, Donald. The truth. All your friends at Fox hated you from the start and hate you even more now. Rupert cut you off. He picked Tiny D DeSantis. Sean and Laura won't have you on. Even Tucker admitted it. He hates you. <laughs> Passionately, You could handle that, but Fox wants to make you disappear. Switch off the spotlight. Tucker couldn't wait to ignore you most nights. And Rupert, he promised to make you disappear. After all the money you made him, and as the walls are closing in on you, they've hung you out to dry. So what are you going to do, Donald? For once, we'll help you. You may not like us. The Losers Project. But you know we always tell the truth. Fox deserves to be punished. You're strongest on Twitter. Go back there. Tell your people to drop Fox. It's the only way, Donald. The only way. When Vladimir Putin invaded a peaceful Ukraine, his brutal shock troops committed hideous war crimes against women, children, and the elderly. He bombed cities, towns, and villages. America and the world gave Ukraine weapons, supplies, and intelligence. The Ukrainians put their courageous soldiers in the line of fire. With great sacrifice, this alliance broke the invasion, pushed it back, liberated millions. Victory for Ukraine is still in sight, but the war isn't over, and the new front is in Washington, where mega Republicans want a Putin victory. They promise to cut off aid to Ukraine if their side wins. You heard that right. They want to help Putin win, threatening the United States with nuclear annihilation. It's sick. It's wrong. It's MAGA. If their side wins in 2024, Putin wins, and the blood will be on our hands. Rupert Murdoch thinks Fox viewers are stupid. He told us Fox stood with Trump, stood with America, that Fox was the mega network. But behind their backs, he was laughing. Rupert admits he knew from the start that the stolen election lie was a joke, a con, a fraud, a fraud he pulled on Donald Trump, the mega base, and the Fox audience. The people he made into mega heroes, off the air, they called them liars kooks and crazies. Fox knew they were lying, but made millions tricking their viewers. Rupert knew the election wasn't stolen and told you it was. Sean and Tucker and Laura knew. Everyone at Fox knew. They lied and kept lying, even when it led to violence and death. That's Fox News, and that's the truth. Donald Trump had far wiser instincts about American foreign policy than any leader in at least a generation. President Putin, uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. I just received a beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un. And then we fell in love. Viktor Orban has uh, done a tremendous job. He apparently said, this is a quote, why are we having all these people from whole countries come here. I strongly endorse President Bolsonaro. I had a uh, call with President Putin and congratulated him on the victory, his electoral victory. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. We got a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? I said my button's bigger than yours and my button works. Yes, I said. <laughs> Glad to have a MAGA packed Supreme Court? Proud that they lied under oath to get the job? If so, thank a MAGA Republican. If you enjoy seeing our rights disappear one by one, thank a MAGA Republican today. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. I have to concede one point. Today's far right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called... Don't give up! This is 
The Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. When I read this, I feel he did tell us. What did he tell us? He told us that the participants violated election laws and that they mischaracterize these payments for tax purposes. And that tells us everything we need to know about what the crimes are, what the criminal intent was, because Alvin Bragg doesn't have to prove which crime at the end of the day. The crime doesn't even have to be committed or started or just, or intended. just intended, and that they that meaning they meant to commit a crime or conceal a crime. And so I, I feel like he told us everything we needed okay. to know in this statement of facts. Can I jump in? Because I think the crux of it, I was saying to Poppy earlier, I, say, I said, I believe they are telling us, especially on page seven, where he talks about the $420,000 to Michael Cohen. It seems that they were upping the amount that they were paying him so that he could report it as income. Exactly. And then that would be a violation of the tax code. Whether or not he did it, he reported it. The intent was for, was there for them to that it was fraudulent am i correct in that absolutely correct okay. and and an analogy that i think is easy to understand is in the context of a burglary a burglary is a trespass which is a misdemeanor right you enter and remain unlawfully somewhere right. but what makes it a crime i'm sorry a felony is if you intended to commit a crime therein and so somebody can walk into your apartment and get stopped and arrested right there before they committed a crime a prosecutor has to prove that they went in there to, to commit a crime. Place. You don't know which one it is. Right. They could, it could have been a sexual assault. It could have been a violent crime. It could have been to take something. And you'll look at the surrounding evidence. Did he have uh, you know, burglar's tools or did he have a knife? You look at the surrounding evidence and you make an argument to the jury and the jury just has to, to say, oh yes, there was criminal intent there. He wasn't going into sleep, right? So that's what bumps it from a misdemeanor to a felony. That's true, and that and that's why uh, that's why uh, there are underlying uh, crimes that Donald Trump was, uh, you know, engaged in that Alvin Bragg doesn't even have to prove because it's already been proven. The Trump Organization has already been convicted of 17 counts of tax fraud. Right, uh, Michael Cohen has already pled guilty to this scheme, uh, being a part of the conspiracy to to make this scheme real. Uh, Michael Cohn's already admitted that he uh, wrote the checks, that he took a home loan in order to pay her, uh, that Donald Trump wanted her paid and he wanted her paid on the sly, that he didn't want the payment to be released until after the election because if he'd lost the election, he wasn't going to pay her at all. So even in his cheating, he was cheating her uh, depending on the results of the election. I mean, what a disgusting person. Now, the reason why Michael Cohn went to jail and Donald Trump didn't, like I said, is twofold. Number one, uh, you had a, a presumption by virtue of an opinion that was issued by the Office of Legal Counsel inside of the Department of Justice all those many years ago, which still, uh, you know, reigns supreme in the minds of prosecutors. And that is that a sitting president can't be indicted. Okay. So Michael Cohn could be indicted, and Donald Trump wanted Michael Cohn indicted because he felt that the exposure that Michael Cohn, uh, 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 you know, uh, th that the media was uh, getting hip to what happened here, uh, that Michael Cohn uh, needed to uh, be punished, that his fixer didn't fix it good enough and Michael Cohn needed to be punished. Now, what's interesting is that at the time Michael Cohn pled guilty to charges that were brought uh, to his doorstep by the Department of Justice. Jeff Sessions was the Attorney General of the United States. Jeff Sessions was. And Michael Cohn uh, was, uh, met, uh, you know, entered into a plea deal because, you know, he understood that he was facing lots of time in jail because of, you know, doing this uh, in service of a campaign uh, fraud, in service of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 tax code, uh, meaning you were going to claim this as a retainer and income when it wasn't. All of this could have landed Michael Cohen in jail for like 10, 20 years. So he entered into a plea arrangement, right? 
And he pled guilty to a whole bunch of crap. He pled guilty to the tax fraud. Now we understand what the tax fraud was. It was that he was going to claim this $420,000 as, uh, you know, retainer money when it was clearly a reimbursement of a payoff to a porn star in service of uh, an election, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to rig an election in, in Donald Trump's favor. And so there was tax crime there. Well, anyway, what's really important to know is that because Donald Trump was president, he couldn't be indicted, but he was individual one in what became the information, what became, uh, you know, uh, the Michael Cohen case, and that there was a conspiracy between Michael Cohen and individual one to defraud the people of the United States, right? So all of a sudden, Michael Cohn is uh, in jail, okay? Michael Cohn's getting ready. He, he actually reported to jail already. And we get a, a, a new attorney general all of a sudden. Now all of a sudden we have this new AG who auditions for the job uh, by writing an op-ed that catches, uh, you know, the eyes of Donald Trump saying, you need a better fixer than Jeff Sessions, basically. Okay, you need somebody who can really weaponize the DOJ on your behalf. You know, your fixer just went to jail. And you need a new fixer. And uh, I'm a presidential fixer. I fix things for, you know, other presidents before. I was attorney general before. And I can fix things for you. And suddenly Bill Barr becomes the attorney general of the United States. And what's the first thing? The first thing Bill Barr wants done when he becomes the new AG I mean, it's like February, okay, of 20, 2019 when Bill Barr finally becomes, uh, you know, the AG again for the second uh, time. And one of the first things that he wants to do is get the conviction for Michael Cohn reversed. Why does he want to do that? Because he likes Michael Cohn or because Trump likes Michael Cohn now? No, he wants to do that because he wants to fix it so that there is no crime. There is no crime. And therefore, when Trump isn't president anymore, Trump can't be indicted for a crime because the crime never happened. And that's the very first thing that Bill Barr wanted to do, was overturn the conviction of Michael Cohen, and not because he wanted to do Michael Cohen any favors. In fact, when Michael Cohen wrote a book about it, this so incensed Bill Barr's plan that Bill Barr actually said to Michael Cohen, you write this book, you go back to jail. And Michael Cohen was like, I have a First Amendment right. No, no, not, not, not anymore. Not in this United States. Not when I'm attorney general. Not when he's the president. You write that book, you're going back to jail. And they sent him back to jail. That's what Bill Barr wanted to do. And the reason why Bill Barr wanted to do it was because he knew that there would come a day when Donald Trump wasn't president anymore and that Donald Trump was individual one. We all knew that. Everybody knew that. And that Donald Trump would be prosecuted for this conspiracy if he didn't get rid of the conspiracy itself. And that's true. That really happened. That really, really happened. So Bill Barr became Donald Trump's fixer. And not only did Bill Barr weaponize the Department of Justice against any enemies of Donald Trump, okay, and protect Donald Trump instead of being the Attorney General of the United States of America and uh, enforcing our laws or making sure that criminals uh, get prosecuted, which is what you do at the Department of Justice, but instead he became Donald Trump's fixer. The other thing that you need to remember that Bill Barr did, you remember Michael Flynn? Michael Flynn pled guilty, not once, but twice. Why did Michael Flynn plead guilty, and what did Michael Flynn plead guilty to? Well, Michael Flynn was picked up on a wiretap. Yeah, he was recorded. And he was back-channeling to Russia Ambassador Sergei Kislyak a promise that if Russia continued to troll and, and insert itself into the election, if Russia continued to uh, you know, uh, uh, put these ads on Facebook and pay for them in rubles like they were doing, if Russia continued the troll farm out of St. Petersburg with Prigozhin, who's now the Wagner mercenary dude, right? If, if, if all this went well and Donald Trump won with the help of Russia, then Michael Flynn was promising Sergei Kislyak that the sanctions that were put on Russia as a result of Russia annexing Crimea, 
under the Obama administration, Obama put sanctions on Russia because they didn't want to go. I mean, nobody wanted to go to war with Russia. Obama didn't. We didn't. Nobody does. To this minute, nobody does. So we sanctioned Russia for their annexation of Crimea. Michael Flynn, who we saw on TV at the dinner with Putin, who was intercepted on a wiretap with Sergei Kislyak, was promising Putin that the sanctions would be taken off Russia if Donald Trump won. And when the FBI confronted Michael Flynn with this wiretap, Michael Flynn lied to the FBI. That's what Michael Flynn pled guilty to. In 2017, two times he lied to the FBI and he pled guilty twice to both lies that he got caught in making false statements to the FBI. Bill Barr did something. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Nine one one. What's your emergency? America's health care system is broken and people are dying. Welcome to Code Whack where we shine a light on America's callous healthcare system, how it hurts us, and what we can do about it. I'm your host, Brenda Gazar. This time on Code Whack, longtime nurse advocate, single mother, and now California Assemblywoman Pilar Schiavo was the only Democrat to unseat a Republican incumbent in the Assembly last November. What inspired her to get into politics, and what are her priorities when it comes to the three H's she champions? Healthcare, homelessness, and housing. We're highlighting Schiavo's impressive story today in honor of Women's History Month. Welcome to Code Whack, Pilar, or I should say Assemblywoman Schiavo. During this Women's History Month, we're celebrating women lawmakers who tell our stories and transform our lives for the better. That means we're celebrating you. Congratulations on winning District 40, which includes the historically conservative Santa Clarita Valley, California. When I was, you know, working on my campaign, I talked to a bunch of people about health care and was talking to folks who are paying more for health insurance than they are for their mortgage. And, you know, it's just insane how unaffordable health care is and everybody needs it, you know? And so after hearing those stories from nurses, you can't not passionately care about fixing the system. So I've worked to guarantee health care for over a decade and fought for that and believe that we can win that and should win that in California. Get the full Code Wax story on ProgressiveVoices.com and on the PV app. Catch all our episodes by subscribing to Code Whack wherever you find your podcasts. This podcast is powered by Heal California, a nonprofit that uplifts the voices of those fighting for healthcare reform around the country. Until next time, stay healthy. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. It's definitely an eye opener. Um, you know, things can change in an instant. Another deadly tornado outbreak ravages several states with more twisters on the way. When you take on big oil, they usually roll you. Um, that's exactly what they've been doing to consumers for years and years and years. California enacts first in the nation law to rein in big oil price gouging. Plus, it was um, a historic moment for for the climate justice movement. The tiny nation of Vanuatu gets UN to address climate justice. All of those stories and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. The Biden administration, and unfortunately the Democrats in Congress, keep pushing these Green New Deal style agendas. And honestly, Mr. Speaker, they just don't work. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine in East Tennessee. And I'm sure that's the way it is across this great nation. Uh, Hey, Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee. You ever heard about batteries? Just asking for a few million people and for your grandkids. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, 
Another weekend full of deadly tornadoes. Yes, the third tornado outbreak in just three weeks hit the Midwest and the Southeast over the weekend, killing at least 32 people and causing widespread damage across several states, according to officials. But the National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center warns that those areas will have no time to recover before the next round of dangerous storms takes aim at the same areas. While the exact influence of climate change on tornadoes is inconclusive, due to lack of data, studies do show that tornado swarms are increasing in frequency and severity because of man-made global warming. They sure seem to be. The UK's Guardian reports on new research out of Australia suggesting that melting ice around Antarctica will cause a rapid slowdown of a major global deep ocean current that helps circulate ocean heat energy around the planet. The study projects that if nations fail to cut emissions that cause global warming, then melt fresh water off the coast of Antarctica is likely to disrupt and slow that deep sea current by 40 percent in just the next 30 years. That's a slowdown that would alter the world's climate for centuries to come and accelerate sea level rise. Meanwhile, a new study in the journal Nature confirms previous findings that the burden of sea level rise is larger, its effects will hit earlier than anticipated, and rising seas will threaten areas not expecting it due to what the researchers call indirect effects. Indirect effects of rising seas are things like damage to critical infrastructure, like repeatedly inundated roads, bridges, and railroads that can cut off communities that need help for long periods of time. But many communities, they say, are unaware of this risk exposure. So expect the unexpected at this point? Exactly. But some good news. The Department of the Interior this week announced that the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement has cleared the way for the nation's first ever commercial scale offshore wind energy project. And offshore turbine construction can begin off the coasts of Rhode Island and New York, a major milestone toward meeting President Biden's goal of deploying 30 gigawatts of U.S. offshore wind energy by 2030. Well, don't tell Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee. In California, Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom has signed into law the nation's first penalty for price gouging at the pump. It was triggered by gas price spikes last summer that pushed prices to near record highs in the state. The new law gives the State Energy Commission the authority to subpoena private internal oil industry data to investigate whether oil companies are price gouging and punish those companies for excess windfall profits. The state's powerful oil industry spent millions of dollars trying to block the law, but Newsom signed it late last week. We proved that we could actually beat big oil. Well, we'll see. Yes. And finally, a new United Nations resolution introduced by the low-lying Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu and passed unanimously could be a significant first step in making it easier to hold polluting countries and companies legally accountable for failing to tackle the climate crisis. The resolution calls on the International Court of Justice to issue an advisory opinion establishing each government's obligations under international law for addressing global warming impact. That could affect big oil companies facing civil liability lawsuits in courts around the world for knowingly producing planet warming emissions while deceiving the public about it for decades. Here's Vanuatu's prime minister before the landmark vote at the U.N. Together, we will send a loud and clear message not only around the world, but far into the future, that on this very day, the peoples of the United Nations decided to tackle the defining challenge of our times, climate change. For much more on all of these stories and the many we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Find, follow, and share us planet-wide on the Facebooks, Twitters, and Mastodons at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. And this has been your Green News Report. Please help progressive voices support the Green News Report by stopping by bradblog.com slash donate. Mary had a little man, man, man. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. 
Who's there? Hey! It's a segment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. We're going to go to the Department of Justice now, and that stunning headline, the president's former National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn, uh, has, his charges against him have been dropped huh. by the Justice Department. He pleaded guilty twice for lying to the FBI about his conversations with Russia's ambassador. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, is tracking the story. Good morning, Pierre. George, good morning. And what some are calling an extraordinary move, the Justice Department essentially blew up the first major prosecution by special counsel Bob Mueller. Hmm. And the department appears to be saying that the FBI should never have interviewed Michael Flynn in the first place. <laughs> 29 months after leaving this courthouse in shame, following pleading guilty to lying to the FBI, the Justice Department that convicted Michael Flynn now seeking to throw out the case. In a highly unusual and perhaps unprecedented move that shocked some law enforcement officials, the department seeking to throw out a conviction where the defendant had admitted to his crimes twice in open court. <laughs> Flynn's guilty plea centered around lying about his contact to then-Russian ambassador Sergei Kislyak. He was fired for misleading the vice president about his communication with the ambassador, and when confronted by the FBI, lied again. I fired him because of what he said to Mike Pence. Very simple. No <laughs> career prosecutor signed on to the motion to dismiss, including the special counsel prosecutor who had worked the case. But Attorney General Barr's hand-picked acting U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia concluding that Flynn's prosecution was unjustified and that the lie he told the FBI was, quote, not material because the Bureau had decided to close an investigation into whether Flynn had been compromised by the Russians before they conducted the interview. Now the president who forced Flynn out is calling him a hero. He was an innocent man. <laughs> he is a uh, great gentleman. And the president directed more fire at the FBI for a Russia investigation that he believes should never have been started. They're dishonest, crooked people. They're scum, and I say it a lot. They're scum, they're human scum. Critics complaining overnight that Barr is simply doing the bidding of the president in trying to systematically undermine the Russia investigation. This morning, House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler calling for an inspector general investigation. And that inspector general investigation did occur. It did happen. And here is what the Department of Justice inspector general found. Now, the reason why Bill Barr was saying we have to get rid of the uh, Flynn uh, conviction, we have to get rid of it, is because the Flynn conviction would also expose Donald Trump to the obstruction of the Mueller investigation after the president wasn't president anymore. And so Bill Barr was, uh, you know, called in to fix all of this, all of this stuff that Jeff Sessions was doing. Jeff Sessions was literally prosecuting people for lying to the FBI, a la Michael Flynn, who was caught on a wiretap promising the Russian ambassador that should you support Donald Trump and continue to support him to write right into the White House, Donald Trump will take the sanctions off of Russia. Donald Trump will do that for you. So that's why you have to continue to support him. And when he was asked about it during Crossfire Hurricane, uh, Flynn lied to the FBI. And the FBI had him on a wiretap. The FBI had him on video. We saw it. Uh, he was sitting there uh, in Russia with uh, Vladimir Putin at Vladimir Putin's dinner table. OK, we all saw the evidence. Well, uh, Jeff Sessions saw it, too, and decided that he was going to prosecute Flynn. Flynn lied to the FBI, and that became the crime, okay? And so Flynn uh, was asked to enter into a plea deal or not. He said he wanted to. He entered into a plea deal for lying to the FBI two times about two different things during Crossfire Hurricane. Okay, the same thing with Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen was prosecuted for funneling and laundering money payoffs to Stormy Daniels and to step, uh, to uh, Kara McDougal, one using the uh, a, a, a home loan and then getting reimbursed through the Trump organization, which was a way to launder, launder the payments, right? And the other was David Pecker doing it at uh, AMI, at the uh, media company that owned the Inquirer. Well, David Pecker entered into a non-prosecution agreement with the Department of Justice, right? He was ready to just, you know, sing like a, like a canary, but he first wanted protection. He wanted a non-prosecution agreement, which he got. When all this started to, you know, like make itself known to Donald Trump that this could come back and bite him in the ass on the day that he's not president anymore, Donald Trump decided two things. One, he would always be president, always, because if he wasn't, there was a chance that he would be prosecuted. And two, 
these cases could be disposed of with the right kind of fixer. And those cases, once they were disposed of, didn't exist and therefore could never come and bite him in the ass. So Donald Trump actually uh, was, was, was turned on by Bill Barr's, you know, uh, uh, you know his 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 romance uh, when he wrote this uh, you know op-ed in the in, in the paper telling him I got this I know just how to do this I know just how to fix this for you but Sessions ain't the guy he's screwing you and you don't even know it he doesn't even know it it's not that he's a bad guy it's that he's stupid and you need to get rid of him and you need to, to you know get hold of me and I will fix everything because Crossfire Hurricane if you say that the premise upon which Crossfire Hurricane was started, the predicate for all these charges, wasn't real or was bogus, then the charges all can be washed away too, and there's no exposure for you once you're not president anymore. And Donald Trump liked the sound of that, and so he actually fired Jeff Sessions and hired Bill Barr. So now let's, uh, you know, remember that we've already had the inspector general's uh, investigation into whether or not Michael Flynn, uh, uh, whether the investigation into Flynn's lying was justified, whether Michael Cohn was just. So on Crossfire Hurricane, whether that was opened legitimately, the inspector general found, quote, we conclude, I'm reading from the IG report, we concluded that the quantum of information articulated by the FBI to open the individual investigations of Papadopoulos, Page, Flynn, and Manafort in August of 2016 was sufficient to satisfy the threshold established by the department and the FBI. Okay? So they, 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 they totally screwed Bill Barr in their findings. Bill Barr's entire MO was going to be to say that the Mueller investigation was predicated on something that didn't need to happen. That the Mueller investigation, that crossfire hurricane, that the whole investigation was garbage and garbage in, garbage out. So the IG, after he interfered to get Michael Flynn off, which he did, the, 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 everybody was like freaked out. What do you mean? He pled guilty, but he pled guilty twice. Not just once, but twice. Now, all these years later, a new AG is going to come in and he's going to say that he shouldn't have even been asked these questions about why he was caught on a wiretap talking to Kislyak, telling Kislyak, giving him guarantees on behalf of the Trump campaign that should Trump become president, sanctions will come off of Russia. That was an illegitimate uh, question that the FBI asked him about. And that that was Bill Barr's uh, uh, game. That was all Bill Barr's doing. Okay, and it's really disgusting. It's 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 really uh, you know amazing. But once he disposed of the Flynn, he felt emboldened. Barr did, and he said, "You know what? We also need to get Michael Cohen's uh, case thrown out, even though he's already in jail. We need to get that case thrown out. Know why? Because that case." will come back and bite you in the ass on the day that you're not president anymore. That case is still a live case because in that case, there's a conspiracy that's been alleged and Michael Cohn pled guilty to it. So it's a live conspiracy case with one of the conspirators already pleading guilty. You are the other conspirator. That will come the day that you're not president and you will be charged with that. We need to do something about that. And what I'm suggesting you do is we drop the Cohen case, that we actually vacate the Cohen case. We say it didn't happen. It didn't exist. Michael Cohen was wrongly convicted, just like Flynn. And that way it goes away. And when you're not president, nothing can happen to you. And Bill Barr went about trying to do that, too. And how did he do that? He called SDNY in New York that was investigating it. I have to concede one point. Today's far-right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos.
Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive, but to fill them with cheap, compliant children. Huckabee Sanders rushed to the aid of these corporate powers, eliminating a bothersome Arkansas law that had required Tyson, Walmart, and other big employers to get a special state permit to put any child under 16 to work. The meddling hand of big government creeping down from Washington, D.C., she bellowed, will be stopped cold. We will get the over-regulating, micromanaging, bureaucratic tyrants off your backs. So she is using the meddling hand of big state government to creep into the lives of vulnerable children. She is not alone. Ohio's Republican-controlled state government is moving to extend the number of hours bosses can make children work. Iowa wants to let 14-year-olds work in industrial freezers and laundries, and Republicans in Congress have shrunk the number of investigators and lawyers policing child labor abuse so abusive corporate managers know there is little chance they'll be caught. Most damning, these corporate politicians value children so little that they've set the maximum fine for violating the workplace safety of minors at $15,000 per child. For multi-million dollar conglomerates, that devaluation makes it much cheaper to endanger children than protect them. This is Jim Hightower saying, America should not even be talking about child safety rules in dangerous workplaces. It's shameful to have any children working there. Howdy ho, folks, and thanks for tuning in to my Hightower Radio Commentaries. And guess what? There's even more Hightower waiting for you online. Subscribers to my Substack newsletter, Jim Hightower's Lowdown, get commentaries, articles, interviews with progressive sparklies, live events, historical nuggets, and more. Go to jimhightower.substack.com to sign up, and you'll get more. That's jimhightower.substack.com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2010. That was the day an explosion in the upper Big Branch mine killed 29 miners. This is the second of two parts commemorating that disastrous moment in labor history. The accumulation of explosive methane gas was so pronounced that the mine had to be evacuated several times leading up to the disaster. A 126-page Governor's Independent Investigation Panel report detailed the systemic failures of safety systems and at governmental agencies charged with enforcing regulation. Lack of proper ventilation, adherence to rock dusting standards, and proper maintenance of of machinery were main factors. The panel also held the Mine Safety and Health Administration responsible for disregarding the documented risk of methane outbursts at the mine, overlooking the deadly potential of a precarious ventilation system, neglecting to use its regulatory authority to force technological improvements, and allowing the U.S. mine safety system to atrophy. They determined that MSHA could have issued flagrant violation citations and had the authority to shut the mines down, but didn't. The report noted the cozy relations between mine owners, politicians, judges, and regulators. Specifically, the ease with which state mine officials move from employment with industry to government and back. Despised union-busting CEO Don Blankenship, who was tried and convicted to one year in jail, insisted his mine... So it is I watched it on TV. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. The Southern District of New York, at the same time as, as, as ourselves at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, uh, we're looking at the so-called hush money payment issue. And then we learned from the Southern District of New York uh, that they asked us to stand down. Hmm. And by stand down, I mean they were communicating that they had this ongoing investigation and they wished that we uh, put our efforts on hold um, while they completed their investigation. And obviously that was a discretionary call by me whether or not to do that, but I felt it was entirely appropriate. Obviously the Southern District of New York is a uh, it's an excellent organization with, with great leaders and prosecutors, and I felt that was appropriate for me uh, to press the pause button. Okay, so that was uh, the former district attorney of Manhattan, Cyrus Vance. 
And Cyrus Vance is no longer the district attorney of the borough of Manhattan. Now Alvin Bragg is. So here's what's important to know as we, uh, you know, discuss what that stand down thing is about. Okay, so SDNY is the federal, it's the Southern District of New York uh, office of the DOJ. It's federal. It's the Department of Justice, okay? And your ultimate boss, when you work in the Southern District of New York, even though Southern District of New York prides itself on being very independent from D.C., from Washington, Southern District of New York's ultimate boss is the Attorney General of the United States. At that point, it was Bill Barr. And Bill Barr wanted to kill the local investigation into the Michael Cohn hush money payments and the local investigation into uh, the Trump organization and tax fraud and the local investigation uh, that was a civil case that was going on. And so the Department of Justice under Bill Barr called the elected borough district attorney Cyrus Vance and said we need you to step back we need you to stand down we need you to quit your uh, investigation into Michael Cohen and the hush money payments you know why you know why you're stepping on the Department of Justice and the Department of Justice has this uh, very large investigation going on and uh, we're going to look into all of these matters and so you need to pause your investigation while we do ours and Cyrus Vance decided that the Department of Justice and SDNY was, you know, a very professional office. They had always had, uh, you know, this uh, reputation for being independent of the Department of Justice, even though they are the Department of Justice. And so he would defer and he would shut down his investigation into Michael Cohen. Now, Cyrus Vance has a reputation for doing that with the Trump family before, and it didn't look good to New Yorkers. New Yorkers weren't having any of it because Cyrus Vance was uh, looking at Ivanka Trump, okay, and uh, also Junior for some time before Donald Trump was president for fraud that went into the sale of the Trump property in the village in Manhattan, Trump Soho. And he was, uh, you know, he was talked into or decided that he wasn't going to go ahead and prosecute them for some fraud that he had found happened with the sale of apartments in Trump Soho in that building. So Sirens Vance uh, had a bad reputation with regard to prosecuting the Trumps prior. Well, Cyrus Vance is no longer the district attorney, as we all know, and Alvin Bragg is. And the district attorney in Manhattan represents the borough of Manhattan and the state of New York is his boss, okay? Not the feds. It's a state thing. And so Alvin Bragg, after Cyrus Vance was told to stand down and said he agreed to do that, Alvin Bragg comes in and Alvin Bragg goes, I don't agree to do that. I'm doing an investigation. Know why? Because the Trump Organization was just convicted on 17 felony counts, okay? Uh, 17 guilty convictions for Donald Trump's companies. Something real is going on. Something prosecutable is going on. This is a, a fraudulent company that, uh, you know, laundered money for this hush money payment. And Donald Trump did it to, uh, you know, hide the payment. Michael Cohn went to jail for this crime. Donald Trump's not the president anymore, Bill Barr is not the AG. DOJ isn't, the SDNY doesn't answer to Bill Barr anymore. I'm going to do it. I'm doing it. And he did it. And he did it. Now, Bill Barr has subsequently admitted to, uh, you know, uh, inserting himself into the Roger Stone case, into the Michael Flynn case, into the Michael Cohen case. And, and, and what he was trying to do was make those crimes go away even for the people who pled guilty to them so that the crimes didn't exist when Donald Trump was no longer president. I hope that was a good explanation for you about what's going on here because that is what's going on here. And what's really frightening and gross is that Donald Trump stands on the stage and accuses Merrick Garland's Department of Justice, accuses Alvin Bragg's uh, district attorney's office in the state of New York in the borough of Manhattan of doing exactly what Donald Trump's Department of Justice and what Cyrus Vance in, in, in Manhattan actually did in service of Donald Trump.
it's not even projection anymore because projection says that whatever I'm doing, I'm going to accuse you of. It's already happened. They've done it. And now they're accusing the current occupants of these offices of doing what they'd already done. Bill Barr was a fixer. After Michael Cohn was, uh, you know, pled guilty, Donald Trump needed a fixer, but he needed a presidential level fixer. Somebody who understood government, which Donald Trump did not. Somebody who understood what the Department of Justice could do, where it could assert itself, where it could, you know, just get rid of charges, where it could say, well, oh, and how do you get rid of charges? Well, you say that the predicate, the underlying theory of the case was unjust to begin with. And this is what Bill Barr did with Crossfire Hurricane. This is what he did. This is why QAnon and freaks of nature out there think the Russia investigation was a hoax, because Bill Barr wanted you to. And that's why Bill Barr got out ahead of the Mueller report three weeks before he allowed you to see the redacted Mueller report, three weeks before, and told you, nothing to see here, move along. This droid means nothing to you and literally use the force on you to try and blank out your mind from the fact that Flynn did plead guilty, from the fact that Manafort was in jail. In fact, Bill Barr got Manafort released from jail. Does anybody remember that? Your reaction to the release of Paul Manafort from prison? (laughs) Well, it's highly suspicious. It seems to be another step in the politicization of the Justice Department where the president's friends, uh, people the president supports, are treated one way and everybody else is treated the other way. Uh, Just another example, uh, like the uh, uh, outrageous decision to drop the prosecution of Michael Flynn after he stood up in court and swore under oath that he was in fact guilty. So now everybody can see what has been going on at the Department of Justice in the Trump administration with the former Attorney General Bill Barr showing up and volunteering to be the new Michael Cohn, to be the new fixer. And in order to fix all of this crime, all of this uh, you know, accountability, he had to say, none of it happened. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. RandyRoach.com. This is Stephanie Miller, and here's what you missed. I have to say, it is a, a magical time when you remember where you were for Donald Trump's first indictment. But this is probably only the beginning, isn't it? I mean, I, it, it's it, that's what's extraordinary, is all this crying and gnashing of teeth already. You're like, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is day one, right? It is. And it's interesting. I mean, it makes some chronological sense, right? This is the earliest crime that he committed. Uh, This was one that was designed to steal the presidency, deprive the American voters of the full value of their vote back in 2016 when he was a private citizen running for president. So chronologically, this is the first. Now, of course, he also committed crimes while president and he committed crimes after he left office. What is your take on what the reporting thus far? Yeah, you know, when it comes to Donald Trump committing crimes, I mean, he never was a one off, right? He's yeah. lived a life of crime. And, you know, just looking at the Stormy Daniels hush money payment, um, that was a conspiracy. We know it was a conspiracy that in, included Donald Trump and Michael Cohen. Did it include David Pecker? Didn't it, did it include Alan Weisselberg? We do know Pecker was in the business, in the habit of running these catch and kill operations. Why? To assist Donald Trump in his election pursuit. So it doesn't surprise me at all. I've been saying for quite a while, you know, if Alvin Bragg indicts Donald Trump, it is not going to be a standalone misdemeanor falsifying business records case. It's going to involve lots of charges. It's going to involve felony charges. And if the CNN reporting is accurate, 34, I think when it's unsealed and we all get to read it for ourselves on Tuesday, you know, it's going to kind of knock our justice socks off. Hear all this and more on the next Stephanie Miller Show. There are some who want to divide us to make a political point or turn a profit. 
Joe Biden just wants to get things done. In just two years, Joe Biden's done a lot. Biden brought both parties together to rebuild our roads and bridges and pass laws that lower the cost of prescription drugs, deliver clean drinking water, and bring manufacturing jobs back to America. President Biden knows we can get more done if we come together, because Joe Biden's a president for all Americans. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2010. That was the day an explosion in the upper Big Branch mine killed 29 miners. This is the second of two parts commemorating that disastrous moment in labor history. The accumulation of explosive methane gas was so pronounced that the mine had to be evacuated several times leading up to the disaster. A 126-page Governor's Independent Investigation Panel report detailed the systemic failures of safety systems and at governmental agencies charged with enforcing regulation. Lack of proper ventilation, adherence to rock dusting standards, and proper maintenance of machinery were main factors. The panel also held the Mine Safety and Health Administration responsible for disregarding the documented risk of methane out bursts at the mine, overlooking the deadly potential of a precarious ventilation system, neglecting to use its regulatory authority to force technological improvements, and allowing the U.S. mine safety system to atrophy. They determined that MSHA could have issued flagrant violation citations and had the authority to shut the mines down, but didn't. The report noted the cozy relations between mine owners, politicians, judges, and regulators. Specifically, the ease with which state mine officials move from employment with industry to government and back. Don't give up. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Action to the release of Paul Manafort from prison? Well, it, it's highly suspicious. It's, it seems to be another step in the politicization of the Justice Department where the president's friends, uh, people the president supports, are treated one way and everybody else is treated the other way. Uh, just another example, uh, like the uh, uh, outrageous decision to drop the prosecution of Michael Flynn after he stood up in court and swore under oath that he was, in fact, guilty. Uh, this is unprecedented. And uh, we have a real problem with the uh, Justice Department being subverted and politicized to be the personal agent of the president instead of the Department of Justice of the United States. We reported the history of Bill Barr. Uh, and this committee you run, uh, are there any plans to have Mr. Barr come back in to address all of this? Well, yes. Um, he was, uh, he had agreed to come in and testify before the committee on March 31st, as you pointed out, and that was put off. Uh, we've been uh, in communication with them. And now that uh, the District of Columbia has uh, extended the stay at home order till June 8th, we are saying that we expect to see. Barr in front of our committee on June 9th, the very next day. So Bill Barr actually did go in and, uh, you know, he was like, uh, yeah, whatever, you know, it's, uh, I interfere, you know, uh, Flynn, uh, you know, the predicate for the case, started talking legalese, basically saying the predicate for the case, uh, you know, that uh, Michael Flynn pled guilty to was, uh, you know, erroneous. And uh, so fruit of the poison tree, meaning if you, if you opened up a case into Michael Flynn based on crossfire hurricane, which I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it was a hoax. It was illegitimate, okay, even though Mueller found, what, he indicted 34, 37 people, and uh, Donald Trump was guilty of obstruction of justice 10 different times, but he was president, so he couldn't be prosecuted. So Bill Barr understood what his job was, and his job was to say that the predicate for the entire Crossfire Hurricane investigation and anything that came from it, including Michael F Flynn's confession of guilt— uh, that it was all fruit of the poison tree, that it all had to be wiped away. All of it. Manafort, Flynn, uh, uh, everybody. Everybody, could, you know, free pass because the predicate was wrong. There was no reason to open Crossfire Hurricane. And finally, in the end, we had the IG's report. And the IG at the Department of Justice said, 
No, that was a legitimate, uh, you know, uh, predicate. That was that was a legitimate case that actually legitimately interfered in the 2016 election. The Russians had a troll farm. Thirty, you know, you you indicted, uh, you know, because we don't have extradition with Russia. There will never be a trial of the people indicted as being the interferers in the Russian portion of the Russian interference into the 2016 election. And it's only because we don't have extradition. But they were charged, they were indicted for their part in it. That really did happen. Uh, Michael Flynn really did go sit and have dinner with Putin. Michael Flynn really did plead guilty uh, after he was confronted with intercepts with wires with wire tapped intercepts this is why bill barr goes i really do think spying did occur because he's saying they had absolutely no business opening up crossfire hurricane in the first place so whatever they found that michael flynn was doing and promising the russians in exchange for their support can't be used that's what fixers do and that's what bill barr's job was and that's what bill barr did And you know why he did it, do you? It's real simple. Bill Barr did it because he's an Opus Dei Catholic. Bill Barr did it so that he could be the Attorney General of the United States in the exact moment that three super uber Catholic, right-wing Catholics could be put on the Supreme Court with Donald Trump nominating them. That's why he did it. He did it to get the Supreme Court. Remember, in the end, Bill Barr is a lawyer, a big one, a huge one. And his love is the law. And he realizes that if Satan ever came back, he would come back as a lawyer. And if somebody wanted to ban abortion, if somebody wanted to take away the right to vote, if somebody wanted to gerrymander, if somebody wanted to do, they would need the Supreme Court to do it legally. And so Bill Barr went about making illegal things legal by saying whatever illegality happened during the investigation called Crossfire Hurricane, during the investigation of Robert Mueller, whatever you got as a result of that investigation doesn't exist anymore because the investigation shouldn't have existed. And I'm telling you that, and that's what you're going to believe. Even though the inspector general in the end said, oh, no, it it was a legitimate investigation. It needed to happen. And that is what happened. That is what what, what occurred here, okay? And everybody was being asked, you know, like, what turns a guy like Flynn? Like, everybody knew what happened. What turns a guy like Flynn? And Barry McCaffrey actually laid it out for you, like, uh, you know, the part that everybody played. Bill Barr's part has never really been exposed. I think I'm the only person that will tell you that it is my opinion that Bill Barr did all this to get the Supreme Court, okay? I really, in my deepest, deepest heart of hearts, believe that that's why Bill Barr showed up, that that's why Bill Barr uh, volunteered himself to be Trump's fixer, is because uh, the the dark money, you know, the uh, donors trust people, the Kerry Severinos, the the Leonard Leos, okay, they all needed Bill Barr to be in there at that moment when they could seize the Supreme Court. They needed Bill Barr, a guy like Bill Barr, and and Bill Barr figured this is how I do it. This is how I get in there. I become the Attorney General, and the reason I uh, I will be picked is because I will promise Donald Trump that I could get rid of all the convictions, Flynn's, Manafort's. Cohen's, everybody who pled guilty, I can, I can get rid of all of it for him so that there are no conspiracies existing once he leaves office, if he ever leaves office or whatever. And that's why Bill Barr was not opposed to Donald Trump losing the election because he already got what he came for, right? And that's why at the end he said, well, I'm not going to help him fix the election. I mean, I have no reason to, but he had every reason to fix these investigations at the time for Donald Trump so he could be there and make sure Donald Trump picked the guys on the, the, the people on the list that the Federalist Society wanted picked for the Supreme Court. So that's why he did it. Why did Michael Flynn do it? Why did Michael Flynn turn? Why did Michael Flynn become a Russian agent? Well, that's easy. It was alarming to see him enjoying a banquet dinner with Putin on the Russia television coverage of that event early on. But what what turns a man like Mike Flynn? 
I don't know. I saw him in Afghanistan, and he, you know, he was an important part of the McChrystal uh, effort to stop terrorism from coming back to American shores. So he's a very capable intelligence officer. He got the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and he failed there. And he essentially got fired uh, by the Pentagon and by President Obama. Ah. Then he started to go off the deep end. So, I mean, all the way through the, the campaign where he's chanting, lock her up, this is not the language we expect. From the director of intelligence. So that's what happened to Flynn. Flynn got fired. Flynn failed at his job at DIA. He failed. He was fired. And uh, he was full of revenge. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Trump isn't back. He never left. He picked Kevin McCarthy as his speaker. He owns the Republican Party, and his minions run the show. Hell, he's even back on social media. He's coming. You think a few liberal Republican billionaires are going to change MAGA's mind? Or weak DC consultants? We, in the end, will win. For all the noise about other Republicans, you know the truth. He's going to do what he did in 2016. Destroy his Republican opponents one by one. Little Marco. Even this guy. Maybe especially this guy. Ron DeSanctimonious. The lies. The disgusting insults. Blood coming out of her wherever. The racial provocations. Look at my African-American. It's all coming back. And it's time to choose once again. Where do you stand? For America or Trump? One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kiev. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kiev, and I can report Kiev stands strong. It stands tall, and most important, it stands free. Freedom. There is no sweeter word than freedom. There is no nobler goal than freedom. There is no higher aspiration than freedom. And all that we do now must be done so our children and grandchildren will know it as well. Freedom. Let us move forward with a abiding commitment to be allies not of darkness, but of light. Not of oppression, but of liberation. Not of captivity, but yes, of freedom. May God bless you all. And may God bless the heroes of Ukraine and all those who defend freedom around the world. Last week, we sent a questionnaire to every Republican presidential candidate asking about Ukraine. And maybe the most newsworthy response that we received was from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Quote, while the U.S. has many vital national interests, DeSantis writes, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute is not one of them. The Republican backlash to DeSantis calling it a territorial dispute when Russia invaded Ukraine was immediate. This is not a territorial conflict, this is war of aggression. I just think that's a misunderstanding of the situation. It's not a territorial dispute any more than it would be a territorial dispute if the United States decided that it wanted to invade Canada. This is a chance to stop Putin before it gets to be a bigger war, and China's watching. Just because someone claims something doesn't mean it, it belongs to them. This is an invasion. If you don't get that, you're not listening to what he's saying. You know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. The content of this advertising. I have to concede one point. Today's far-right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive.
Fatality. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Jeffrey Berman was the U.S. attorney in SDNY, the federal prosecutor's office in Manhattan, while all this was happening. And Jeffrey Berman technically was recused from directly overseeing this case. Um, the, the hush money case, because he had been part of the Trump campaign before he was appointed U.S. attorney. Right. And he thought that might have seemed like a conflict of interest, given that the case involved fraud allegations about campaign expendi expenditures. So he was technically recused from overseeing the case. But he was in charge of the U.S. attorney's office when this case went to court. And in his book, in this book, Holding the Line, that Jeffrey Berman published about his time as U.S. attorney in SDNY, he explains in detail that Maine justice under Trump reached into SDNY and intervened uh -huh. with the prosecutor's office in Manhattan to protect Trump in this case. Yep. He says it explicitly. This is from page 24 of Jeff Berman's book. Quote, the first time Maine justice intervened, sorry, uh, even though I was not overseeing the Cohen case, I still had to deal with other issues involving it, all of them deriving from the same source, Maine justice and its attempts at interference. The first time Maine justice interfered was when the information was being finalized. Information is a term of art in this context. Mm -hmm. After Michael Cohen agreed to plead guilty, the charging instrument against him uh, became an information rather than indictment. So that was the title of the document that Berman is referencing here. It was an information. It was about 40 pages long, he says. And it, quote, referenced a person identified as individual one as having acted in concert with Michael Cohen. Right. He says, quote, there was zero doubt as to the identity of individual one. It was Donald J. Trump. Berman says, quote, consistent with DOJ guidelines, we first submitted the information to the public integrity section at Maine Justice. They signed off. We then sent a copy to the deputy attorney general at the time, Rod Rosenstein, mm. informing him that Cohen's guilty plea was imminent. The next day, the prosecutor in my office, who was overseeing the case, received a call from Rosenstein's principal deputy. He was aggressive. Why the length, he wanted to know. He argued that now that Cohen is pleading guilty, we don't need all this description <laughs> of the crime. The prosecutor responded, what exactly are you concerned about? Rosen's deputy, pr Rosenstein's de deputy proceeded to identify specific allegations that he wanted removed from the information. Almost all of them were items referencing individual one, Donald J. Trump. Yes. And that was all coming from Bill Barr. That was all to wipe away any conspiracy that involved Donald Trump that Michael Cohn pled guilty to because... There would come a day when Donald Trump would not be president. And on that day, Donald Trump would be prosecuted for his role in a conspiracy to launder money through the Trump organization to pay back Michael Cohn, who then commits tax fraud. And Donald Trump commits tax fraud because he says that this is uh, income, that this is regular income owed to Michael Cohn, but it isn't. It's uh, a hush money pay payment being paid back to Michael Cohn on the sly and putting it in the ledger as income. Michael Cohn then says, well, if I'm going to claim uh, this payback as income, you need to double it because I'm in the 50% tax bracket. Oh, and I want a $50,000 bonus on top of it. And so the number is going to be $420,000. And Bill Barr calls SDNY, the federal prosecutor in New York, and tells them this is how the indictment must read. All references to individual one must be removed. And Jeffrey Cohn, who is in charge of SDNY at this time, is recused himself from the Michael Cohen case. Why? Because Jeffrey Cohn worked on the Trump campaign. He's not some Democrat. Jeffrey Berman is a Trumper. Jeffrey Berman worked to get Trump elected. He just thought that he was getting, you know, a Jeff Sessions, not a Bill Barr. And when Bill Barr came down the pike, he told Berman, you need to get rid of the conspiracy. 
What's with the speaking indictment? The man is pleading guilty. We don't need your indictment to speak. We don't need it to tell the story of a conspiracy. You hear me? Get rid of individual one. And does it happen? The revised document, now 21 pages. Ah. Remember, it had started as 40 pages. Correct. Now, 21 pages kept all of the charges to which Cohen was pleading guilty, but removed certain allegations, including allegations that Individual One acted in concert with and coordinated with Cohen on the illegal campaign contributions. You know how long ago that was? But now it all makes sense. Now you can see what the fixer Bill Barr was doing. And it wasn't until this moment that I realized it was Bill Barr all along. Yes, Jeff Sessions was out. You're out, Tom. You're out. I need a wartime consigliere. And Bill Barr came in. And it wasn't until this moment that I realized it was Barzini, I mean Barr, all along. And now I hope you understand what is going on in the world around Donald Trump. Now I hope you understand what a criminal it is. And you know what's really upsetting? The, the most upsetting point of all of this is that this man, this corrupt and fraud and fixing man, this, this mob boss, this guy, clean my hands, was president of the United States. That's devastating. That is just devastating. That that could happen in this country and that it did. And that we had a criminal in charge of the Department of Justice, that we had a criminal in charge of all of our government, all of it. It's devastating. Everybody suspected that there was something wrong with him. Everybody suspected he was less than above board. People understood that he had no character, he had no morals, that he did say things about grabbing women, and you could do it when you're a star. And he did have this narcissism, and he was, you know, uh, you know, uh, he was just not a, a, a person of the highest moral turpitude. He wasn't a person of good character. People understood that about him. But do you realize that this country was so strong, that this country was so worthy that it survived four years of a mafia boss being in charge of all of it, and that there were people inside who refused. Because when the, prosecu when the Department of Justice comes knocking at the prosecutor's door and tells that prosecutor, quit prosecuting, quit looking, quit asking questions, quit the investigation, just stop it. It's not good. It's not good for our purposes. But our purpose is supposed to be enforcing the law. Our purpose is supposed to be a nation of laws, not men. That's our purpose. No, it isn't anymore. The purpose of this country has completely changed. And if you don't like it, you have two choices. Either you do what I say or you resign because that is all that a prosecutor can do in response to orders from on high to do bad things. That's it. That's all that you can do. And people did resign along the way. People tendered their resignations and said, I'm not going along with this. This is, uh, this is, this is anti-American. This is anti-democratic. This is something other than, you know, uh, a president, uh, you know, trying to achieve a worthy goal for the American people. This is a president manipulating uh, the levers of power in order that he is never found guilty of crimes he's already committed and continues to commit while he's president of the United States, hence two impeachments. And we haven't even got to the special counsel now. We haven't even touched on Jack Smith's investigation into espionage and, and, and using our intelligence documents as fundraising vehicles, if that's what he was using them for, and I suspect it was, because all he ever cared about, all he still cares about is money and power, period, end of story, right? So we haven't even touched on that, and we haven't even touched on, uh, you know, Jack Smith's investigation into the insurrection uh, against uh, the United States of America that uh, was directed by Donald Trump and his minions. We haven't even gotten there. We haven't even looked at how many people in Congress currently 
we're part of this conspiracy. We're coordinating this conspiracy. We're affecting this conspiracy and, you know, efforting this conspiracy and moving it forward. We haven't even cleaned our house yet. We're just now getting to the explanation for how did we end up here? This is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. How did I get here? Yeah. You may ask yourself. And that's why he needed a wartime consigliere, because it was life during wartime. Save, save, save this one. Save this one, because <laughs> the day will come when the trial occurs, and you will know what's going on. <laughs> RandyRhodes.com 911, what's your emergency? America's healthcare system is broken and people are dying. Welcome to Code Whack, where we shine a light on America's callous healthcare system, how it hurts us, and what we can do about it. I'm your host, Brenda Gazar. This time on Code Whack, longtime nurse advocate, single mother, and now California Assemblywoman Pilar Schiavo was the only Democrat to unseat a Republican incumbent in the Assembly last November. What inspired her to get into politics, and what are her priorities when it comes to the three H's she champions? Healthcare, homelessness, and housing. We're highlighting Schiavo's impressive story today in honor of Women's History Month. Welcome to Code Whack, Pilar, or I should say Assemblywoman Schiavo. During this Women's History Month, we're celebrating women lawmakers who tell our stories and transform our lives for the better. That means we're celebrating you. Congratulations on winning District 40, which includes the historically conservative Santa Clarita Valley, California. When I was, you know, working on my campaign, I talked to a bunch of people about health care and was talking to folks who are paying more for health insurance than they are for their mortgage. And, you know, it's just insane how unaffordable health care is and everybody needs it, you know? And so after hearing those stories from nurses, you can't not passionately care about fixing the system. So I've worked to guarantee health care for over a decade and fought for that and believe that we can win that and should win that in California. Get the full Code Wax story on ProgressiveVoices.com and on the PV app. Catch all our episodes by subscribing to Code Whack wherever you find your podcasts. This podcast is powered by Heal California, a nonprofit that uplifts the voices of those fighting for healthcare reform around the country. Until next time, stay healthy. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. It's definitely an eye opener. Um, you know, things can change in an instant. Another deadly tornado outbreak ravages several states with more twisters on the way. When you take on big oil, they usually roll you. Um, that's exactly what they've been doing to consumers for years and years and years. California enacts first in the nation law to rein in big oil price gouging. Plus, it was um, a historic moment for for the climate justice movement. The tiny na- say they are for law and order, but they are not. They say they are for due process, but they are not. They are for whatever is convenient at the time as applied to them. And then whatever is convenient at the time as applied to their political opponents. And if those two things require a complete cognitive dissonance and a divorce from any stated principle of consistency, then they don't care. And you know what? They get away with it because as many, many of you have written to me and said, David, the right doesn't care about hypocrisy anymore. The right doesn't care about double standards. So it's not even worth pointing them out to them because they aren't phased. It's whatever is convenient for me and not for thee. And that is it. Well, we are going to learn very quickly, indeed, what the repercussions are uh, of the crimes with which Trump is accused. This is only the first indictment today. It is now being circulated that another indictment in Georgia could be coming at the end of April, which we will talk about tomorrow. These are truly unprecedented times, not because anybody in the uh, uh, investigative community has done anything wrong, but because we are now starting to see accountability for a unique and unprecedented one man crime spree 
that was the former president, Donald Trump. One of our sponsors today is Fume. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad part from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award winning device that does exactly that. Fume is not electronic. There's no vapor or harmful chemicals. Fume is just a delicious flavored air that makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts, which is great for fidgeting, which can be great for people breaking bad habits. Look at what people online are saying. They weren't sure what to expect, but ended up loving the taste and the feel. Stopping is something lots of people put off because it's difficult to do. But switching to fume is easy and enjoyable. There's no reason that you can't be the next fume success story. Head on over to tryfume.com and use the code tax. I don't know how. From the ColeSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. You ban books, you ban drag. Kids are still in body bags. That's the sound of protesters chanting at the Tennessee State Capitol on Thursday as two of their elected state representatives were expelled from the legislature almost one week after supporting gun reform protests that made their way inside the Capitol. Representatives Justin Jones and Justin Pearson were voted out, a move that's only occurred twice in the state since the Civil War. During the so-called debate, Representative Jones explained some of the past infractions by members that did not result in expulsion. Let's talk about expulsion. For years, one of your colleagues who was an admitted child molester sat in this chamber, no expulsion. One member sits in this chamber who was found guilty of domestic violence, no expulsion. We had a former speaker sit in this chamber who is now under federal investigation, no expulsion. We have a member still under federal investigation, no expulsion. We had a member pee in another member's chair in this chamber, no expulsion. Justin Pearson was also expelled. You say to protest is wrong because you spoke out of turn because you spoke up for people who are marginalized. You spoke up for children who won't ever be able to speak again. You spoke up for parents who don't want to live in fear. You spoke up for, for, for Larry Thorne who was murdered by gun violence. You spoke up for people that we don't want to care about in a country built on people who speak out of turn, who spoke out of turn, who fought out of turn to build a nation. But Representative Gloria Johnson narrowly escaped by just one vote. When she was asked later why she was spared while her two colleagues were removed, she explained. It might have to do with the color of our skin. And what was the expulsion about? Well, the resolutions to expel these members accused Jones, Pearson, and Johnson of breaking House rules by chanting into a megaphone during a protest in the chamber calling for gun control, which came after a school shooting in Nashville that left three nine-year-olds and three adults dead. One Republican described the chanting as mutiny. Really? Another described it as worse than the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. President Biden took to Twitter, and of the expulsions, he said, it's shocking, undemocratic, and without precedent. There will be special elections held to fill those now vacant seats. Jones and Pearson can run in those special elections to retake their rightful place within the Tennessee legislature. Just astounding. The Biden administration on Thursday released a report on the chaos that erupted during the 2021 withdrawal from Afghanistan, placing the blame on a lack of preparation by the former guy in his administration. The 12-page summary of the report said President Biden was, quote, severely constrained by Trump's choices, including the 2020 peace deal he entered with the Taliban. The report said the subsequent rapid takeover by the Taliban created problems with evacuating Americans and Afghan civilians. But still, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said that Biden's decision to withdraw U.S. forces was the right one. 
He added the United States had long ago accomplished its mission to remove from the battlefield the terrorists who attacked us on 9-11. Trump accused the White House of, quote, disinformation. Of course he did. So have you done your income taxes yet? Well, this year, the deadline falls on April 18th. And in case you are worried, the IRS on Thursday said that average taxpayers should not be worried about more audits after some Republicans tried to gaslight the nation about how the IRS will utilize a new $80 billion investment. The funding came from the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed last year along party lines and is meant to support the agency in cracking down on tax cheats and providing better service to taxpayers. As a result of these changes, the IRS is expected to collect more than $100 billion in new revenue over a 10-year period, and they reiterated that the new funding will be used to audit complex businesses and taxpayers who make over $400,000 a year. Why is this needed? Well, only four-tenths of a percentage point of taxpayers earning at least half a million dollars were audited in 2019. That was down from 4.5% in 2011. The poorest filers were audited at more than twice that rate. That will all change now. Thank you for voting for the Democrats. Well, this is a uh, very religious weekend. Friday, Good Friday. Sunday is Easter. And Passover began on Wednesday. Of course, this is the time when the most religious lands in the world are fighting. What happened? Well, Israeli police raided the Al-Asqa Mosque, a contested holy site in Jerusalem. At least 40 Palestinians were injured in two raids. And the Muslim holy month of Ramadan overlapped with Jewish Passover this year, which officials warned could cause tension to escalate. Meanwhile, on Thursday, rockets were fired at Israel from Lebanon. Israel retaliated with airstrikes there and in the Gaza Strip. Happy Passover. Happy Easter, everyone. Mary had a little man and a man to fall. We believe that all men are created equal. Hey, a magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Okay, okay, okay. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. Yes, I tell you, it was a sad day on Saturday. All hope seemed to be lost. Representatives were thrown out of the state house. Democracy seemed to be at its end. Seemed like the NRA and gun lobbyists might win. But oh, that was good news for us. I don't know how long this Saturday in the state of Tennessee might last. But oh, we have good news, folks. We've got good news that Sunday always comes. Resurrection is a promise, and it is a prophecy. It's a prophecy that came out of the cotton fields. It's a prophecy that came out of the lynching tree. It's a prophecy that still lives in each and every one of us in order to make the state of Tennessee the place that it ought to be. And so I've still got hope because I know we are still here, and we will never quit. Out of order. Out of order. Out of order. You're out of order. You're out of order. This whole courtroom is out of order. Everything's out of order. Happy, uh, well, no, not happy. Good. $5 $5 Friday, you bastards. Oh! Good $5 Friday. It is $5 Friday here at Free Speech TV. Uh, this is the day that we ask people to give $5 repeatedly. <laughs> Recurring. So uh, if, you, uh, if you support independent media and you're interested in anything that's happening in this uh, country, which is moving so swiftly away from democracy and moving towards something else, and I'll let you name it, what you think this is, because this ain't democracy. This is something. I don't know what it is exactly, but this isn't democracy that we got on our hands here. When a gerrymandered state can produce a supermajority in its state legislature and then through its supermajority, which isn't even a legit supermajority because it was a gerrymandered, gotten supermajority, 
can then foist its legislation, its laws, its will on the people who they did not, uh, who did not vote for them, and start taking away everything from the right to travel, the right to uh, make medical decisions with your doctor, the right to read the book you want to read, the right to uh, know our history, the right to know everything uh, about this country so that you don't have to repeat the sad, dark roots that you sprung from again. And now they can even take away not just your vote, but if you manage to jump through all the hoops and cast a vote and select a representative, they can take that representative away from you with their supermajority. They can do court packing. They can take away constitutional rights with a supermajority. And we've been telling you about the dangers of supermajority, not majorities, supermajorities. What is a supermajority? That means two thirds of the legislature. Two thirds of the legislature can override anybody's veto. Two thirds of the legislature can invoke cloture. Two thirds of the legislature can impeach any justice that they don't like. That's why I keep telling you about the results, the mixed results we got in Wisconsin this particular Tuesday. Because while Wisconsin, as a group, as a state, voted for a pragmatic person who believes that the Constitution gives a right to privacy and equal protection under law to all, she can be impeached by the supermajority that you just got in Wisconsin. Two thirds of a vote means she can be impeached. And will they impeach her? Well, let's see what happens when the gerrymandered maps are ruled to be racially discriminatory or dilute the power of what is a 50-50 Republican Democratic state. Let's see if she can survive an impeachment with a supermajority in the legislature if they don't like uh, the fact that she's going to take away the gerrymandered maps. See what I mean? This is what went on in, in f- on full display yesterday in the state of Tennessee. This is what happened in Tennessee. This is what it looks like when a supermajority practices bad, ugly, racial politics. This is what you get. You get a toxic mix of something that isn't democratic, but is something else, and you're going to have to name it. You're going to have to tell me what it is. But they went there. They went there yesterday in Tennessee. I'm holding my breath in, for, for Wisconsin and some other uh, supermajority states. Look at what happened in the, you know Texas. My God, man, you got an indicted attorney general, a man who's been under indictment for, what, five years now for securities fraud, making, uh, you know, uh, uh, enforcing the laws in Texas. I mean, it's so unequal and it's so bizarre and it's so undemocratic and uh, again, what do we call this? I'll tell you what the protesters called it. I'll show you what the protesters called it. Those are the kids, okay? They, they, they have just about had it with being an acceptable price. Okay, an acceptable price for Republicans to pay in order for everybody to, uh, you know, be armed to the teeth. And of course, now they're giving, you know, it it would be so it would be so much easier for those of you who think that you have guns to beat back a tyrannical government. See, what you're seeing there in Tennessee is a tyrannical government. Some of you are going to say, see, Ram, that's what I'm saying. That's why we need a gun. Wouldn't it just be easier to vote them out? Just saying, just a suggestion. Wouldn't it be easier to give uh, uh, the Republicans the boot? Wouldn't it? I mean, it's 2023. Everybody gets to vote I- I next year. Wouldn't it be better if you suspect that your government in your state or your government in the feds, uh, you know, uh, are being tyrannical and they are eroding the democratic principles of the Constitution that say you have a right to interstate travel, you have a right to do interstate commerce, you have a right to privacy in your own person? I mean, wouldn't it be easier to just vote them out than it would be to collect and create a freaking arsenal and then have to go shoot people? I mean, wh- one is easier than the other. That's just a gimme.
But the government is getting very tyrannical in these red states. They're getting very tyr- Listen, Florida, Florida, 80% of Floridians this week, 80% of Floridians said to the little red state high heel boot, hullabaloo boot wearing governor that we didn't want, we didn't want more guns in our state. We didn't want permit, permitless carry. We didn't want people to be able to have weapons on their person at the public deli. Okay, we didn't think that in a state where people are, I don't know, they're on many, many different prescriptions all at the same time. We have a difficult enough time keeping them awake behind the wheel of a car here, okay? Everybody's on 12, 15 meds. It's, it's, uh, you know, now we said, you know, maybe putting a gun in grandpa's hand when he gets like number 47 at the deli counter and I have 46 and this peeves him, this pisses him off. Maybe him having a gun, you know, isn't such a great idea. 80% of this state agreed with me. And guess what? He did it anyway. He did it anyway. That's tyranny. When you don't get the representation that you voted for, when you don't get heard or seen or responded to by your government. It's an out-of-control government. But this is why they want everybody to have guns. They want everybody to have guns because they really believe that whatever it is they're ushering in, in place of democratic governance, is going to require armed citizens to protect them. We also had the governor of Florida choose for himself at taxpayer expense a small but well-armed militia answerable to him and only him do you see clear for take off randy roads randy roads i have to concede one point today's far-right republican party does not discriminate against women In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive, but to fill them with cheap, compliant children. Huckabee Sanders rushed to the aid of these corporate powers, eliminating a bothersome Arkansas law that had required Tyson, Walmart, and other big employers to get a special state permit to put any child under 16 to work. The meddling hand of big government creeping down from Washington, D.C., she bellowed, will be stopped cold. We will get the over-regulating, micromanaging, bureaucratic tyrants off your backs. So she is using the meddling hand of big state government to creep into the lives of vulnerable children. She is not alone. Ohio's Republican-controlled state government is moving to extend the number of hours bosses can make children work. Iowa wants to let 14-year-olds work in industrial freezers and laundries, and Republicans in Congress have shrunk the number of investigators and lawyers policing child labor abuse so abusive corporate managers know there is little chance they'll be caught. Most damning, these corporate politicians value children so little that they've set the maximum fine for violating the workplace safety of minors at $15,000 per child. For multi-million dollar conglomerates, that devaluation makes it much cheaper to endanger children than protect them. This is Jim Hightower saying, America should not even be talking about child safety rules in dangerous workplaces. It's shameful to have any children working there. Howdy ho, folks, and thanks for tuning in to my Hightower Radio Commentaries. And guess what? There's even more Hightower waiting for you online. Subscribers to my Substack newsletter, Jim Hightower's Lowdown, get commentaries, articles, interviews with progressive sparklies, live events, historical nuggets, and more. Go to jimhightower.substack.com to sign up, and you'll get more. That's jimhightower.substack.com. Com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1882. That was the day trade union leader and suffragist Rose Schneiderman was born. She arrived from Poland and settled in New York City with her family as a child. Her father died soon after, and Rose entered the workforce at the age of 13. She sewed caps, 
and organized with the United Cloth and Cap Makers. Rose became a chief organizer with the New York Women's Trade Union League and played a prominent role in the 1909 uprising of the 20,000. While touring Ohio to rally support for women's suffrage in 1912, Schneiderman said, what the women who labor wants is the right to live, not simply exist. The right to life as the rich woman has the right to life. And the sun and music and art you have nothing that the humblest worker has not a right to have also. The worker must have bread, but she must have roses too. She grew frustrated with the privileged middle-class women of the New York Women's Trade Union League and began organizing with the ILGWU. But she soon quit, aggravated by the leadership's indifference towards organizing women workers. Snyderman devoted her energies to women's suffrage. She would soon return to the Women's Trade Union League. By 1926, she served as its national president and became close friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. President Franklin Roosevelt appointed her to the National Advisory Board, where she wrote NRA codes for industries with women working. Don't give up. Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Three state representatives all protested hand in hand together. Two were black men, one was a white woman. Did she do anything different based on your reporting that would keep her in her position and keep these men out? Look, there is no coincidence that this happened in the state where the Ku Klux Klan was founded. Hmm. I think that Tennessee has been backsliding if it ever left uh, its racist history. And I think it is just now that the nation is seeing this. Gloria Johnson did not do anything any different. And there was uh, pretty obviously a racial component to this expulsion. And it wasn't even just the fact that Gloria is a white woman. It is also the fact that she was defended by two white male attorneys who are themselves former members of this body. Ah. So they fit in. They fit in with this body of people who were then voting for the expulsion. And frankly, Gloria was only saved by one vote. And that was probably the vote of Justin Pearson, who was later expelled. I mean, this is just so unbelievably obvious. They literally went there. They're like daring us as decent human beings who believe that other human beings that live under our constitution all deserve dignity uh, and all deserve respect. I mean, those of us who, 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 who live like that, those of us who know that that is the way to a happy life, you know, just give everybody, uh, you know, the dignity and respect they deserve as a living, breathing human being in this country in a great democracy, right? Uh, she actually had to deploy the good old boys network on the good old boys in order to save her job yesterday and because she's white you know she's a former teacher too gloria johnson uh justin pearson and justin jones are the three expelled tennessee legislators pearson and jones as you know are young black men and they all represent very diverse populations they come from knoxville they come from nashville uh and uh, she's a she, gloria johnson is a teacher a former teacher and uh she actually had taught school in a classroom where children were shot and killed this is why she went into the state legislature she said once you see the the, the terror and the trauma on the face of children in your care that are in your classroom that have you know been subjected to guns in the school and death you never forget it and you realize you have to do something about it. And that's what this is all about. This was about a, 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 a fight to get Tennessee to consider, consider red flag laws, to get Tennessee to consider safe storage laws, to get Tennessee to consider banning assault weapons or requiring the registration of assault weapons or putting assault weapons in an armory at a hunting club if you wanted to have them, okay? There was no way that Tennessee was ever going to take any gun away from any person in the state of Tennessee. They won't even say the word gun, right? And so these young black uh, members who got themselves elected, okay, went and uh, tried to have a debate about guns. And for this, for this, 
They, they, they were removed. They were expelled. A vote was taken. And by the way, they did use their supermajority. You, you, you have 23 Democratic members in the Tennessee legislature, 23, 75 Republicans, uh, but 23 Democrats. And all 23 represent cities in Tennessee where people work, where people you know, uh, live uh, together, where people know each other but aren't afraid of each other. Okay, and uh, one of them, one of them is a man named John Ray Clemens. He's a, a Democrat, and uh, he was trying to have a debate with these Republicans who knew they had a supermajority. They didn't have to listen to the debate. <laughs> they didn't have to listen to anybody say anything. They didn't have to say the word gun. They didn't have to say the word, uh, you know, uh, ethics. They didn't have to say. They didn't even have to make a case for expulsion. They just needed to put the expulsion motion on the floor and vote on it. Well, the, the member of the House that wanted to debate it, my God, man, he, he was like, y- you people are not even, like, how old are you? You're like children. Why don't you just grow up if you can't stand to have a conversation? Why are you even in this room? This is humiliating. This is bizarre behavior on the part of adults. Chairman Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are talking about nothing less than 75 people overruling the wishes of 78,000 people. And you're going to cut off debate? Give me a break. Is this a circus? You are talking about kicking somebody out of this body. Grow up. If you can't sit through a conversation or a debate on something no less than expelling a colleague, grow up. Get out of here. You don't belong here. You want to call the question? I am humiliated. I am embarrassed. Look at the rules of procedure, the ethic rules. It, the purpose of this is to hold the respect and confidence of the people. Representatives should avoid conduct that even appears to violate the trust the people have placed in them. What are we doing? What are we doing? Calm the question. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, point of order is if you don't want to sit here and have this discussion, withdraw the resolution. Let's move on to the people's business and actually address the issue that created what made you uncomfortable. The loss of life, not just those six losses of lives. People okay. in every community across this state that continue to be killed by gun violence. Hey, Chairman Clemens, you, you're, it's a point of order. I understand you're upset by the call of the question. If somebody have a point of order where we are, not, not a speech on the floor, but you're, we're at a point of order. Cameron Sexton, everybody, please, uh, you know, remember him. He's the Speaker of the Tennessee House, Cameron Sexton. Uh, I mean, you're talking about dead children. You're talking about dead teachers. You're talking about a dead school administrator. Uh, You're talking about gun violence in Tennessee that is off the charts. You're talking about more guns, more death, because in every red state where they have more guns, there is more gun death. There is more gun violence. That's just a fact. And all they were trying to debate, all they were trying to talk about was how to keep it out of school how to keep it away from kids. Kids were begging, just let us live through high school. They had signs that said children are greater than guns. Signs that said children are greater than guns. They had to actually write that on a sign to try and start a conversation about their value in society uh, versus the value of their little uh, AR-15 pin that signals to the world, yeah, we're going full fascism, we don't give a damn. We don't give a damn. We don't care about children. We don't care about... And by the way, black activist members will not be tolerated. We're, we're not going to you know, listen to you. We don't want you here. We're going to use our supermajority to take away elected officials from 78,000 Tennesseans who voted for you three. We don't give a damn what those people want. We don't like their choice. And there are enough of us now where we can literally bully you right out of your elected office. And that's what we're going to do. And people of good conscience stood up on the floor and said, are you freaking kidding me? 
You're talking about expulsion, and you you you, you, you don't even want to have a debate. You want to end the debate. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy this is Stephanie Miller, and here's what you missed. It's the High Holy Days. Happy Ramadan. Happy Passover. Happy Easter. You know, I'm trying. Look, I'm busy trying to keep, you know, hoping that these eggs make, you know, the religious indoctrination pass over my children. That's my focus. <laughs> but I am in a, I am in a great mood. Uh, um, yeah. Look, there are some weaknesses with this indictment there are some legal defenses that trump has i'm sure we'll talk about them yeah. but the idea that we should be sad <laughs> that this yeah. you know career criminal is finally facing the first hopefully not the last better not be the last yeah you know charges in his entire criminal life nah that does not make me sad yeah well, and you said that. You said if you think Bragg has a weak case, then Trump should beat it. And that should be your mm-hmm. white uh, your white white wing talking point. As hey. you say. <laughs> Let the process play out. Our MAGA king will beat the rap. That's the rule of law take. Right? Yeah. Like that's how that's how this is supposed to go. You don't have to say, you don't have to threaten the prosecutor's wife, okay? Right. You don't have to threaten the judge. You don't have to do all of these usual white wing authoritarian MAGA crap. You can just say there's been a charge. We believe our guy is innocent, and we will see you in court. Trump has legit. And the thing that I don't like about the indictment is that, as opposed to other indictments that I hope are coming, yeah, Trump has some legitimate legal defenses here, right? A lot of times when we deal with Trump and the law, what we're talking about is that he'll say something, but it'll be like a wackadoodle, crazy person. Um, argument that like only Alan Dershowitz and Jonathan Turley are like, yes, sir. Can I have another, sir? <laughs> and by the way, I was never on Epstein's boat, sir. Like it's it's that <laughs> only those lawyers um, will go for it, right? But here, he's got a credible case. I don't know that it's a winning case, but it's credible. Hear all this and more on the next Stephanie Miller Show. You. Yes, you. You're an independent thinker. You're a free thinker. You love facts. You love to figure out and orient yourself in the world so that you can solve your own problems, right? Right. So you need randyroads.substack.com. Each and every day, we will put up facts for you. We will curate news that you need, news you can use, for lack of a better fun term, each and every day into your inbox. And yes, for free. All you need to do is go to randyroads.substack.com and become a subscriber for free. Or if you're so inclined, get yourself a subscription. The subscription will deliver to you each and every day. A commercial free on demand video and audio podcast. You choose how you'd like to do your intake on the go, put in some buds, listen on the go with the audio, want to sit and watch it on a nice big screen. Get the video in your email each and every day, okay? So subscribe and never miss an episode. Plus, we give away a ton of free stuff, like uh, every Friday, free show. So join us at randyroads.substack.com. Become a subscriber, free or paid, but remember, all of our work is viewer-supported. We don't take any corporate money. So thank you for your time and attention and for being a subscriber at randyroads.substack.com. Thanks. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1882. That was the day trade union leader and suffragist Rose Schneiderman was born. She arrived from Poland and settled in New York City with her family as a child. Her father died soon after, and Rose entered the workforce at the age of 13. She sewed caps and organized with the United Cloth and Cap Maker. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. All right, everybody, it is $5 Friday. $5 Friday, Woohoo! It's a simple little matter. It just lasts a couple hours, and what we ask for you to do is call 877-378-8669. That will get you one of the happy peppy people in Denver, Colorado, 
who you are supporting with your $5 recurring gift. Now, if you could do one time, that's great. But this is really about giving $5 a month uh, so that you support independent media like Free Speech TV, which, by the way, is probably, uh, you know, the only place that didn't cover wall to wall the indictment of uh, the former guy because other crap was going on in this here world that was important, like elections in Wisconsin and the uh, expulsion of uh, uh, two uh, young African-American legislators in Tennessee simply because they could, simply because they can. They're going there because they can. And they're assuming that you can't figure out what to do about it. They would be wrong, but that's why there's free speech TV, to help you figure out what to do about it. Okay, so donate online at freespeech.org if you are so inclined. And if you want to do it on your phone, no problem. The uh, text number is 44321. And then put in the letters FSTV for Free Speech TV. We'll send you a secure link. You could do $5 and make it recurring. You could do more. (laughs) But $5 is what $5 Friday is about. So thank you very, very much. All right. So what to do about it? Yes, that's the question that, uh, you know, this is why I make the little bucks, okay? (laughs) This is this is kind of why, you know, uh, I'm here. And uh, let's say you're not. All right. The first thing that we need to do is get these guys back into the legislature. You know, is to not take it. Right. So, yes, they 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 were successful yesterday in showing you just how racist they are in the Tennessee good old boy legislature. And that if you let them gerrymander your freaking maps, that they would dilute everybody's power, like the people who live in places where there are a lot of people like Nashville, they're divided into three separate districts now. And this here legislature isn't done dividing you. They're not done diluting your vote. They're not done saying, oh, you got two Democrats that live next door to each other. You know, that would be two votes if we kept them in the same district. Hey, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll put one in this district and one in that district. And therefore, there's not two. There's just one. That's what they're doing. Okay. And still. Some people managed to show up and vote for their, their, their favorite person and have it counted. And so you got uh, uh, 23 Democratic legislators elected in this last election to serve in the Tennessee State House, right? And they're, they're, they're just going to say, well, it doesn't matter how you vote. It really doesn't matter how you vote. And if we don't like who you sent here, we're just going to get rid of them. We'll get rid of them by hook or by crook. We'll get rid of them by saying, we don't believe in First Amendment rights. We don't believe they had the right to get on the floor and support the people in the gallery. Why? We're going to expel them based on decorum, decorum. They're going to expel people for decorum. You know, you do have people in the legislatures all across this country. I mean, Tennessee is not the odd duck that is host to people who have been convicted of domestic battery, people who beat their wives and have been convicted of it. Tennessee isn't the lone state that has convicted felons in its legislature. They don't get expelled there's not, they're not facing expulsion. You have child molesters in uh, all kinds of uh, legislatures. They don't get expelled. They don't, uh, you have people that are under investigation, federal investigation for everything from security. You got people that are under indictment for uh, securities fraud that are your attorney general, that are in charge of enforcing the laws in your state, and they're under indictment. They don't get expelled. This is bull crap, okay? They just wanted to send a message, and the message is, we, we got the reins of power, and we're going to use it as illegitimately as we feel we must in order to purge our legislature of people we don't like. We don't like. That's what's going on here, and it's, it's really disgusting. And they signal to you by choosing two black people and one white woman. And then they said, the white woman, she passes. She can go. The blacks, no. And what are you going to do about it? Well, like I said, the first thing you're going to do about it. On Monday, yeah, on Monday, these two men, these two uh, black guys, these uh, Johnson and uh, uh, Jones and and Pearson, now we're having to learn the entire, uh, you know, uh, legislature in the state of Tennessee. Okay, I'll do it. They're they're city councils. Nashville has a city council that has 40 members on it. It's huge. It's large because Nashville is huge. It's large. So they have 40 council members. They need a quorum. That would be 27 members to convene on Monday. 
If 27 members show up, they got a quorum. And then a simple majority vote is all that's necessary to reappoint Mr. Jones back to his seat, and then he will be an interim House member, and the election will happen in 2024, and the people of his district can go reelect him. Same thing for Pearson. Uh, Pearson is in Shelby County. Shelby County only has 13 members, so they need nine people uh, to have a quorum, and then a majority, a simple majority, will vote for Mr. Pearson to go back as the interim member in the legislature, and then he will stand for election in 2024, and his district can re- re-vote him back in. So that's what you do about it. That's what you do about it. You make yourself aware of what's going on in your neck of the woods, and you watch your city council, and you, listen, and you make sure that on Monday, they all go back to work. Because Republicans, you know, they got some stuff in their quiver, but we're ready. We're ready. That's the key here. Be ready. And now we know be ready for everything, everything from an armed man on 15 meds in the public's deli, you know, getting pissed off that he's number 47 and I'm number 46 and I got a big order. I need Munster. I need Swiss. And I want it thin, okay? I want it thin. And I don't want honey ham. I want maple honey ham. Oh, yeah. And now I don't want a quarter of a pound. I want a whole pound. Go ahead, slice it nice and thin. You just be quiet over there. And then he blows my brains out. I mean, this you know, what could go wrong? But honestly, honestly, Tennessee is only the first to show you how low they will go. And the reason why is because Tennessee has a really dank, dark history of being one of the most racist states in this nation, which is really sad because you got these great lakes there. I mean, really, really beautiful. And I was considering maybe retiring there in a lake house situation, and now I cannot. So you don't get any commerce. No, I can't live in a state that, uh, you know, is very busy telling me drag queens are the danger I face when our children are facing weapons of of war in their classrooms. But drag queens, that's who's uh, that's who's going to give me, uh, you know, the problem of a lifetime. That's what I need to, uh, you know, shield myself from. You, You can't even have daughters grow up anymore in Texas. You can't have your daughters grow up in Idaho. You can't have your daughters grow up in Tennessee or North Carolina. You can't even have your children, your female children, grow up in these states anymore because, God forbid, something happens to them. You have no options. God forbid they get pregnant and the baby has a fetal anomaly. You know, a birth defect. They'll let her bleed out. Clear for takeoff. Referring to Trump, Carlson says, I hate him passionately. I hate him passionately. We are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. So there it is, Donald, the truth. All your friends at Fox hated you from the start and hate you even more now. Rupert cut you off. He picked Tiny D DeSantis. Sean and Laura won't have you on. Even Tucker admitted it. He hates you. <laughs> Passionately, You could handle that, but Fox wants to make you disappear. Switch off the spotlight. Tucker couldn't wait to ignore you most nights. And Rupert, he promised to make you disappear. After all the money you made him, and as the walls are closing in on you, they've hung you out to dry. So what are you going to do, Donald? For once, we'll help you. You may not like us. The Losers Project. But you know we always tell the truth. Fox deserves to be punished. You're strongest on Twitter. Go back there. Tell your people to drop Fox. It's the only way, Donald. The only way. When Vladimir Putin invaded a peaceful Ukraine, his brutal shock troops committed hideous war crimes against women, children, and the elderly. He bombed cities, towns, and villages. America and the world gave Ukraine weapons, supplies, and intelligence. The Ukrainians put their courageous soldiers in the line of fire. With great sacrifice, this alliance broke the invasion, pushed it back, liberated millions. 
Victory for Ukraine is still in sight, but the war isn't over, and the new front is in Washington, where mega Republicans want a Putin victory. They promise to cut off aid to Ukraine if their side wins. You heard that right. They want to help Putin win, threatening the United States with nuclear annihilation. It's sick. It's wrong. It's MAGA. If their side wins in 2024, Putin wins, and the blood will be on our hands. Rupert Murdoch thinks Fox viewers are stupid. He told us Fox stood with Trump, stood with America, that Fox was the mega network. But behind their backs, he was laughing. Rupert admits he knew from the start that the stolen election lie was a joke, a con, a fraud, a fraud he pulled on Donald Trump, the mega base, and the Fox audience. The people he made into mega heroes, off the air, they called them liars, kooks and crazies. Fox knew they were lying, but made millions tricking their viewers. Rupert knew the election wasn't stolen and told you it was. Sean and Tucker and Laura knew. Everyone at Fox knew. They lied and kept lying, even when it led to violence and death. That's Fox News, and that's the truth. Donald Trump had far wiser instincts about American foreign policy than any leader in at least a generation. President Putin, uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. I just received a beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un. And then we fell in love. Viktor Orban has uh, done a tremendous job. He apparently said, this is a quote, why are we having all these people from whole countries come here? I strongly endorse President Bolsonaro. I had a uh, call with President Putin and congratulated him on the victory, his electoral victory. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. We got a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? I said, my button's bigger than yours and my button works. He just says it. Glad to have a MAGA-packed Supreme Court? Proud that they lied under oath to get the job? If so, thank a MAGA Republican. If you enjoy seeing our rights disappear one by one, thank a MAGA Republican today. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. I have to concede one point. Today's far-right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive, but to fill... Don't give up! This is the Randy Rhodes Show. It is. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. You know, Tennessee leads the way in backwards uh, in discriminatory legislation. We have one of the most, we have the strictest abortion ban in the state. Tennessee's Governor Bill Lee was the first governor to sign a ban on certain types of drag performances and drag performers. Our gun laws are almost non-existent except to create laxer gun laws. And I'm going to point something out that I have not heard mentioned on any other show, but the governor has talked openly about the fact that his own daughter shot herself in the head with one of his weapons when she was a teenager. And he has talked about this publicly. And the fact that that happens and that his friend was killed just last week, and this state cannot, like, cannot even address anything. They can't even say the word gun. Like, I, I don't even know how to overcome that, except with time, people, and continued, continued persistence. Okay. Did you see Stephanie Rule's face there? Did you see her face? I, 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 she, I, 
So what we learned there is that the governor of the state of Tennessee, who refuses to protect children in the state of Tennessee from semi-automatic or weapons of war, whatever you want to call them, uh, these uh, high-velocity, high-capacity uh, uh, guns, refuses to do jack about the prevalence or the uh, you know uh, the, the constant uh, you know murder in his state of children in his state we find out that his daughter his own flesh and blood literally tried to blow her own brains out with a gun and still he just says permitless carry is the way to go. More guns, everybody, more guns. Not even concerned about the suicide rates or the fact that a, 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 a poll was done in Tennessee, no less, okay, and found that one in six kids in Tennessee had thought about suicide in the last year and that one in 12 actually tried it. Doesn't uh, move him. You know, not when the money is rolling in from uh, the NRA or not from, you know, the fact that he's built this monster uh, 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 of, a, uh, of a constituency. And now he's afraid of his own people if he does anything at all to legislate, uh, you know, uh, the prevalence of guns in schools or, or, or uh, this is unbelievable. So, so this, is where we're, this is where we are. We're, we're in a place where you have legislators that are literally afraid of their own constituents they're afraid of them because they filled their heads with lies and conspiracies and tyrannical government memes and every other thing when they themselves are the tyrannical government that's taking away your right to free speech we saw that yesterday your right to uh, 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 you know protest your right to have you know a reproductive uh, choice your right to move freely uh, from state to state uh, your right to uh, you know read a book your right to, you know, go to a drag show. Uh, these are the things you're supposed to be afraid of. And they're fighting these culture wars as a stand-in for solving the real problems because to solve them means you'd have to take on your own constituency. And they're terrified of them. Just like Fox News is terrified of their own audience. Their own audience. And you're going to find that out when the Dominion case starts. You're going to find out that, you know, uh, they, that they understood that their audience was a monster that they built and that they built it on lies and conspiracies and pedophilia stories and, and a tyrannical, uh, you know, a person named Hillary Clinton and this one and that. Meanwhile, uh, you know, they were out there making deals behind everybody's back with adversaries of ours. They were cutting deals, uh, you know, with Saudis who were taking, you know, freaking bone saws to people and saying, don't worry, we'll look the other way just give us two billion dollars on the and 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 they're talk they're going to talk to you about a laptop that they've had for what three four years now hunter biden's laptop that somehow somewhere five years six years seven years ten years from now they're going to find some damn actionable thing on his computer that's you know actionable and not just uh, you know plain old embarrassing and they're going to be able to listen either you're interested in influence peddling or you're not interested in influence peddling and doing something about it but if you are interested in influence peddling welcome Welcome, because we've been talking about it for 20 years and that no good would come from it. But billionaires have purchased themselves state legislatures and these state legislatures are, 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 are pur purchasing courts uh, and the courts are literally taking away one right after the other. And I'm just wondering, like, how fascist are you going to let this get? How fashy are you willing to go? Because we're pretty fascist right now. This is unbelievable to me. Well, now, you know, you, you find out that the governor of the state that's, that's, you know, just kowtowing and bowing down to the NRA, his own daughter tried to blow her head off. And, it, and also he lost a friend. He lo his wife, Bill Lee's wife, Maria, I mean, I'm, now I'm having to educate myself on the entire, you know, political landscape known as the great state of Tennessee, okay? So now I find out that his wife, Maria, was also a teacher, okay? So Gloria uh, Johnson, who, you know, was spared yesterday, she's a teacher. Maria Lee, Bill Lee, the governor of, Te of Tennessee's wife, was a teacher. And the two teachers that were killed at Covenant were best friends 
okay, with Maria Lee, with the with the governor's wife and two of her friends. They were supposed to come over for for lunch or dinner. I, uh, you know, uh, the next that day, that day that they were shot, they were supposed to come to Maria's house for dinner, and they didn't come because they were dead. They were dead. They died in that school, and still he won't uh, do anything about it. He will literally uh, lose friends to death, to gun violence, and say, it's not the gun violence that killed them. Really? Because the doctors would disagree. Because on cause of death, you know, on that line there, it's going to say gunshot is what it's going to say. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the more you know about these, uh, the, these miscreants, the more you understand how dirty they are, the more you understand how they are, in, they are peddling their own souls at this point. You know, you say, well, what are they peddling at this point? I mean, what, they're peddling their own soul, their own eternity, if you believe in that, okay? It's, it's all for sale. They will go to hell for, 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 for a dollar. And then you know what's really crazy? So now we have to be listening to, before all this happened yesterday, we were actually listening to complaints from the Trump camp about the judge, Judge Marshawn. Okay, not only did he have to threaten Judge Marshawn, but he has to threaten his family, his wife and his daughter, right, who worked for an advertising agency that did like uh, online advertising. And one of the clients, when she was running for president, was Kamala Harris. Ooh, turns out that Marshawn gave a, a whopping $10 donation. No, I'm not kidding, $10. He made a $10 donation two times to a get out the vote organization. And one time he gave $25 or $35, it could be 35. I, I don't know if the total of his donations were $35 or if it was one donation of $35 to Biden's campaign. And somehow this disqualifies him. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here looking at the most unethical, disgusting uh, 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 Supreme Court justice that we've ever seen come down the pike. There's big news about Clarence, big, huge news. Turns out, you know, yesterday we were exploring how uh, Harlan, Harlan over there, Harlan Crow, you know, no good ever comes out of a guy named Harlan. Do not name your baby Harlan. There is a good comedian named Harlan Williams. No, there's nothing good in Harlan. No. no, okay, nothing. Nothing. Never. Change his name. Harlan Crow has been supporting uh, the, 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 the justice of the Supreme Court known as Clarence Thomas for 20 years, giving him flights on a mega uh, aircraft, private aircraft, uh, letting him stay in his mega mansion, uh, you know, giving him vacations, hanging out with him at Bohemian Grove. This is a guy who, what, I don't know what a Supreme Court justice makes. What could it be, like $120,000, $150,000 max? And the guy is living large. He's living like uh, he had the number one, uh, you know, rap record in the history of rap. I mean, he is living the life of a rock star, okay? He's living with private jets at his disposal. And his wife, his wife is one of the most gigantic conservative activists in the history of activism. And that's not a uh, that's that's not a reason for him to recuse himself from a case dealing with something his wife advocated for, and that was the insurrection on January 6th. But he didn't have to recuse himself. But Judge Marshawn, who gave thirty five dollars, thirty five, he needs to recuse himself. He needs to excuse himself. He needs to because you know it's just the appearance. What the? And people are going to repeat this. You'll see. They're going to repeat it. Maybe not today. Because today they know they'll, they'll get their head handed to them from me. But people who aren't listening today, who are going to hear this on Fox News and hear Marshawn and that he was a donor to Biden but won't hear the amount, they're going to call me. And I'm going to show them Clarence and they're going to say it's not the same thing. Why? Well, because Trump's being persecuted. Yeah, right. RandyRhodes.com. 911, what's your emergency? America's healthcare system is broken and people are dying. Welcome to Code Whack, where we shine a light on America's callous healthcare system, how it hurts us, and what we can do about it. I'm your host, Brenda Gazar.
This time on Code Whack. How does diversity in politics affect the policies that impact our everyday lives? What challenges do women face when running for office? And once they get there, how do their life experiences influence their political work? To find out, we spoke to California Assemblywoman Pilar Schiavo. It really is so important to have diversity in your legislature and any decision-making body, right? And you see that in our women's caucus where, you know, we're really prioritizing women and children child care is an affordable child care is a huge priority for us as a caucus. I can't imagine any other caucus or group of folks in Sacramento really prioritizing that if it's not women. And just things like that, the Women's Caucus is the one who's, you know, sponsoring these 17 bills around reproductive rights and justice and health care. Women who have these kinds of frontline experiences know what it's like to experience pay inequity or harassment in the workplace or sexual violence attacks on bodily autonomy, having those firsthand experiences and then going to Sacramento and having an opportunity to make policy and shape policy to address those issues, I think is critical and it's really exciting. Let's get the full Code Wax story on ProgressiveVoices.com and on the PV app. Catch all our episodes by subscribing to Code Wack wherever you find your podcasts. This podcast is powered by Heal California, a nonprofit that uplifts the voices of those fighting for healthcare reform around the country. Until next time, stay healthy. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. I think you have to ask yourself, who are they hurting with this? And they clearly think they're hurting President Biden. Oil prices spike after OPEC announces surprise production cuts. Good news, bad news with California's record snowpack. Plus... You know, we're seeing it as a boom for American innovation. American industry is good for the planet as well. Biden administration boosts clean energy and clean manufacturing, cracks down on toxic mercury and lead water pipes. Well, they're busy. All of those stories and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. Over the weekend, hundreds of cases of beer spilled on a Montana train derailment. The train spilled hundreds of cases of beer into this local river, including a whole bunch of Coors Light. But authorities say the water is fine, and so is the river. <laughs> Coors Light Slam. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyne, yet another train derailment in the U.S., but hey, at least this time it was only beer. If only that were the only train derailment in the U.S. this week. Officials say that that train that spilled cases of beer in Montana had no lasting environmental impact, but a train carrying flammable ethanol that derailed in southwestern Minnesota on Sunday forced nearby residents to evacuate their homes after the rail cars ruptured, Mm. igniting a massive fire that burned for days. That's not nearly as funny. Officials say the water and air are safe, but cleanup will take months. And in the East Palestine, Ohio chemical train disaster back in February, the Justice Department has now filed a civil lawsuit against the railroad company Norfolk Southern for violations of the Clean Water Act. Another tornado outbreak, the fourth in as many weeks in the U.S. At least five people were killed in southeast Missouri by an overnight tornado on Tuesday that caused widespread damage. John Hart of the National Storm Prediction Center warns... There will be more systems like this all spring, unfortunately. Climate data on tornadoes is mixed, but evidence suggests that global warming is increasing the frequency, magnitude, and geography of tornado behavior, including increasing dangerous nighttime tornadoes. In California, it's official. After a relentless series of extreme winter storms, the state's overall snowpack is the deepest ever recorded in more than 70 years, officials said Monday, at more than 230 percent of normal. That's good? That is. That's good news for the state's farmers and struggling hydropower industry after years of drought. But state water officials this week also announced they're shifting to flood response to prepare still flooded areas for upcoming potentially disastrous snowmelt. Because it is getting warm out here in a day or two, and that could be very bad news, I guess. Indeed it could. 
Meanwhile, global oil prices jumped after the Saudi-led OPEC Plus oil cartel this week announced surprise cuts to crude oil production, slashing output by more than a million barrels per day to keep supplies tight and prices high, a potential new threat to global efforts to curb inflation. Even though the U.S. is now the world's biggest producer of oil, oil is still traded on the global market, so the U.S. economy is vulnerable to oil price shocks. Energy Analysts say the cartel's cut could add more than 50 cents a gallon to the national average retail price of gas this summer. And I guess we should blame Joe Biden? Well, you know, Republicans certainly will. I would expect no less. But some good news. The Biden administration Environmental Protection Agency has approved California's plan to phase out a wide range of polluting diesel-powered heavy trucks as part of the state's effort to reduce air pollution and climate warming emissions. Great. President Biden was in Minnesota this week to tout the announcement by heavy truck engine manufacturer Cummins that it will invest a billion dollars in making low to zero carbon engines for trucks. Cummins manufactures nearly half of medium and heavy duty trucks in the U.S. Instead of relying on equipment made overseas in places like China, the supply chains will be again made in America. They'll begin in America. I'm sure Republicans will figure out some way to complain about that, too. More good news. The Biden administration this week also released a tranche of half a billion dollars in new funding to build clean energy projects at the sites of current and former coal mines using funds from the landmark Inflation Reduction Act. Nice. The Environmental Protection Agency this week proposed tightening limits on toxic mercury pollution and other contaminants from coal-fired power plants that cause heart attacks, cancers, and brain damage in children. Also nice. And finally... The EPA also announced it has identified more than 9 million lead water pipes across the country in the nation's first ever tally that will help determine where and how to allocate more than $6 billion in new funding for drinking water upgrades. The EPA tally shows that Florida has the most lead pipes. All of this helping people is outrageous. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Find, follow, and share us planet-wide on the Facebooks, Twitters, and Mastodons at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. And this has been your Green News Report. Please help progressive voices support the Green News Report by stopping by bradblog.com slash donate. Mary had a little man. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. International travel on private jets, luxury accommodations on a super yacht, and top shelf hospitality every step of the way. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and his wife Jenny enjoyed it all for free, according to an investigation by the nonprofit group ProPublica. So, who footed the bill? Texas real estate tycoon and Republican mega donor Harlan Crow. We found that uh, Thomas has been taking luxury trips from this Dallas billionaire virtually every year for over 20 years. Trips to California, Texas, Georgia, New Zealand, and just a few years ago. Mr. Crow flew Thomas to Indonesia on his private jet and then took him island hopping for nine days on his super yacht, uh, staffed by stewardesses and a private chef. And we talked to we talked to, you know, we were told that if you were to charter that jet and that yacht yourself, it could easily cost over $500,000. The report says often fellow travelers included big business people and the heads of prominent conservative groups. And it says Crow once gave Thomas a $19,000 Bible that belonged to the legendary abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Oh, good God. Thomas declared that gift and some of the travel in his public financial filings, but the report says not most of of it. Huh. CNN received no response to the report from a Supreme Court spokesperson, and in a written statement, Crow said this is just friendship. 
We have never asked about a pending or lower court case, and Justice Thomas has never discussed one. Uh -huh. I am unaware of any of our friends ever lobbying or seeking to influence Justice Thomas on any case, and I would never invite anyone who I believe had any intention of doing that. <laughs> Still, the revelations in this report have critics in Congress calling for swift and decisive action to impose serious ethical rules on the highest court in the land and every person who sits on it. You know, I mean, it's all influence peddling the whole thing and what good can come from it. And this man did not disclose, uh, you know, these trips. He didn't disclose any of these gifts. Now he's telling the Wall Street Journal today through a spokesperson on the Supreme Court uh, that uh, this this statement is just priceless. He said, um, Harlan and Kathy Crow are among our dearest friends, and we've been friends for over 25 years. As friends do... We've joined them on a number of family trips during the more of, than a quarter century we have known them. I know of no friends that do that. Do you? Do you have friends that say, hey, uh, we're going on vacation. We're going to bring you and you don't have to pay? Because I don't have any friends that say, hey, let's go on vacation together, but you, you know, uh, we'll pay for you. I've never had a friend pay for me to go anywhere or do anything. We've gone on vacations together, but, you know, everybody whips it out. Their credit card, calm, the, calm down. Yeah, everybody whips it out. Everybody throws it into the middle of the table. Everybody, do, you know, oh, oh, you were going out to dinner. Okay, you pay for yours. We'll pay for ours. Here's a card. Here's a card. And uh, we leave it to the waiter and the waitress. Uh, hopefully they passed, uh, you know, some sort of a math class and can do it. But honestly, who has friends that, that, that every single year they're, they're flying you to Indonesia, they're taking you, uh, you know, island hopping, and you, uh, you don't pay for any of this, and this guy is a multi-billion dollar guy, and you're going to hear cases about, uh, you know, uh, business, you're going to hear cases about antitrust, you're going to hear cases about real estate transactions, you're going to hear cases about pass-through organizations, you're going to hear... Really? And it never comes up. Isn't that something? Yeah, Randy, Harlan already told us that none of this was discussed. And it these, never these comes dark up. These dark money, right-wing dark money guys, they're not ferocious liars or anything like that. So Or lobbyists not, or non representing uh, you know, other yeah. billionaires. No. Yeah, we're done here. Even though I saw a painting, I saw a painting, a painting, everybody, of uh, you know Clarence and Harlan sitting around uh, painting. And uh, one of the other people in the painting is Leonard Leo, who packs the Supreme Court uh, at the behest of dark money donors at the behest of billionaire donors at the behest of giant business concerns he takes their money he funnels it through uh, you know donors trust and some other Kerry severino type uh, organizations the heritage foundation etc and so forth and they come up with a list of suitable names of people to serve on the Supreme Court, they hand it to a president who obviously is compromised in his own right and will probably end up in front of a court of law sooner rather than later, and they say, these are the judges that you want. These are the ones you pick. And if he balks or if he, you know, uh, uh, sort of hesitates for a brief second, for a brief moment, and seems like maybe he's too headstrong to follow your lead, he thinks he's the Messiah himself, and he doesn't believe that Leonard Leo is, uh, well, then what you do is you send a new attorney general to be his fixer, and you make sure that that attorney general has the list that Leonard Leo wants. So that, that's another person that's in this painting. And another person that's in the painting is a lobbyist who I kind of recognize from some parties and stuff. But no, they couldn't possibly, possibly be talking about any germane issues that might come in front of the Supreme Court. Oh, hell no. Oh, and by the way, did we ever figure out who the leaker was of the abortion of the Dobbs case? Did we ever find out? No, no, we didn't. Know why? Because it was somebody inside. That's why. This Roberts court is one of the most corrupt, disgusting messes of a court. He ought to be ashamed of himself, John Roberts. He's the chief justice. He's supposed to be... So here's the thing. What do we do about this? Well, you know, there is this little thing that we have called impeachment. You know, we do have that. And it's the only way that you can oh, recall a judge, a justice. It's the only way. 
And for 20 years, this man has not disclosed any of the largesse. He hasn't disclosed any of his private jet travels. He hasn't disclosed any of his sojourns to exclusive retreats around this nation. He hasn't disclosed any times that he's ever visited the all-male, ultra-exclusive, skull-and-bonesy, Yale-like society called Bohemian Grove. He's never disclosed any of it. None of this largesse ever appeared on Thomas's financial disclosure forms. And I will tell you that post-Watergate, there were new laws. Yes, there were laws about the presidential records and who they really belong to and they don't belong to the president. They belong to us and they go to the National Archives for safekeeping and they are the, right? Uh, uh, also, after Watergate, we did uh, financial disclosure laws that uh, don't exactly uh, require that the people that are sitting on the Supreme Court have codes of ethics or codes of behavior or codes of conduct that they must live by. All the lower courts do, but not that court. Why? That would be an affront to them. And so they've done everything to beat back and beat down any idea of ethics codes or good conduct codes that might apply to the Supreme Court. Every time it gets close, they send in Leonard Leo with some checks. I mean, do you understand what's going on here and how you're being duped out of a a just society? Do you understand why we have a two, maybe three, maybe four tier justice system? Because those who do pay get different treatment than those who don't. And those who can pay on the back end get different treatment from those who can't. That's just a fact. And everybody knows it. You know, you take, uh, you, you take some Skittles out of a 7-Eleven and you could end up on Rikers Island pending trial. But you take $2 billion in Saudi money for looking the other way after a Washington Post uh, guy, a Washington Post columnist is uh, dismembered with a bone saw in an a- embassy. You look the other way, you say it's not a thing, it didn't happen, or you hand a list to the incoming royal about the people in his family that don't want to see him ascend to the throne, then he kidnaps those people on that list, puts them in the freaking Ritz-Carlton because that's the level at which these people are entitled to be kidnapped at, kill one guy or torture the other one, and the Ameri- and Jared uh, is never held to uh, you know account or ever asked a question about how did he know or where did the list come from. And on the back end, he gets $2 billion. I mean, either you're serious about this crap or you're not. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Rhodes.com. I have to concede one point. Today's far-right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. Consider Sarah Huckabee Sanders, governor of Arkansas, who became a star in the new Republican crusade to bring back child labor abuse. Pushed by their corporate backers, GOP governors and lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive, but to fill them with cheap, compliant children. Huckabee Sanders rushed to the aid of these corporate powers, eliminating a bothersome Arkansas law that had required Tyson, Walmart, and other big employers to get a special state permit to put any child under 16 to work. The meddling hand of big government creeping down from Washington, D.C., she bellowed, will be stopped cold. We will get the over-regulating, micromanaging, bureaucratic tyrants off your backs. So she is using the meddling hand of big state government to creep into the lives of vulnerable children. She is not alone. Ohio's Republican-controlled state government is moving to extend the number of hours bosses can make children work. Iowa wants to let 14-year-olds work in industrial freezers and laundries, and Republicans in Congress have shrunk the number of investigators and lawyers policing child labor abuse so abusive corporate managers know there is little chance they'll be caught. Most damning, these corporate politicians value children so little that they've set the maximum fine for violating the workplace safety of minors at $15,000 per child. For multi-million dollar conglomerates, that devaluation makes it much cheaper to endanger children than protect them. 
This is Jim Hightower saying, America should not even be talking about child safety rules in dangerous workplaces. It's shameful to have any children working there. Howdy ho, folks, and thanks for tuning in to my Hightower Radio Commentaries. And guess what? There's even more Hightower waiting for you online. Subscribers to my Substack newsletter, Jim Hightower's Lowdown, get commentaries, articles, interviews with progressive sparklies, live events, historical nuggets, and more. Go to jimhightower.substack.com to sign up, and you'll get more. That's jimhightower.substack.com. Com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1882. That was the day trade union leader and suffragist Rose Schneiderman was born. She arrived from Poland and settled in New York City with her family as a child. Her father died soon after, and Rose entered the workforce at the age of 13. She sewed caps and organized with the United Cloth and Cap Makers. Rose became a chief organizer with the New York Women's Trade Union League and played a prominent role in the 1909 uprising of the 20,000. While touring Ohio to rally support for women's suffrage in 1912, Schneiderman said, What the women who labor wants is the right to live, not simply exist. The right to life as the rich woman has the right to life. And the sun and music and art. You have nothing that the humblest worker has not a right to have also. The worker must have bread, but she must have roses too. She grew frustrated with the privileged middle-class women of the New York Women's Trade Union League and began organizing with the ILGWU. But she soon quit, aggravated by the leadership's indifference towards organizing women workers. Snyderman devoted her energies to women's suffrage. She would soon return to the Women's Trade Union League. By 1926, she served as its national president and became close friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. President Franklin Roosevelt appointed her to the National Advisory Board, where she wrote NRA codes for industries with women workers. I watched it on TV. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. I just trying to understand why did you not go to the ethics committee and do the things that are always done in that body? You have not done this to anybody except for two people in 200 years. You can't tell me that there have not been people who have also been disruptive. You've had people that have peed on chairs peed that on did chairs. not get expelled. So I don't understand why you skipped the ethics committee. If you want uh, re- respect and if you want uh, for people to be uh, reasonable, why are you being so unreasonable and why are you skipping steps? I don't understand. You seem to be contradicting. You're not acting the way you want the young people to act. So I, the, the story of, of someone urinate on somebody's chair has is, is never been quantified. I, I, I've quantified? heard many people say that. I don't think you there's mean any how truth much? to that. So what you need Pete? to understand is this is a body of people who decide corporately what we're going to do moving forward. What? This body spoke many times. I brought our caucus together several times since last Thursday to ask the body what we as a group wanted to do. The overwhelming majority... The heartbeat of this caucus says, not on this House floor, not this way. So if there was an idea of sending it to the ethics group, this group, my caucus, which is the supermajority, there are 75 of us, said no. <laughs> no, we're not interested in, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, justice. We're not interested in getting to the bottom. And by the way, whoever peed on the chair, it was never quantified, like how many, uh, you know, ounces of pee. What do we what do we need to quantify? Oh, I was thinking how many times. But oh, it could how, be how many mu- times? It, it could be how much. Yeah, I mean, I thought how much because, you know, I'm a girl and, uh, you know, doctors won't see girls unless we pee in the cup first. We have to pee in the cup. We, we're all pregnant until we're proved not pregnant. And so doctors won't even see us until we pee in a cup. And, you know, the cup is like, how much do you put in there? You know what I mean? It's like, it's such a conundrum. Like, do I fill it to the top? Because that would be kind of disgusting. Do I, you know, I, I, I sort of know I, I, I should do, you know, like at least half. But is it more than, I mean, like, how much do they need? And it, so when he says quantify, I think of like how much. But it could be how many times. It could be how many times. And I mean, listen, here's the thing. 
the first thing that happens to somebody who is, oh, let's say, out of order or unruly uh, in, in, in the House of Representatives is they're reprimanded. Their words are taken down. How many times have you heard that? And you go, well, what does that accomplish? Nothing. OK, but that is a message to them. Don't do it again. You're reprimanded. Your words are taken down. Then uh, you may be censured, right? And they go, well, what good does that do? Nothing. It just sends a message to them that, uh, you know, you're not behaving right. Then perhaps they're fined. Maybe there's a fine for what they did, like peeing on a chair. I would think is a finable offense, okay? Then maybe, maybe there's, you know, an ethics committee hearing uh, if it goes that far. And the ethics committee will then look at, did you do what you did? Was it criminal? Was it just unethical? A la, you know. Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas isn't breaking any laws by, uh, you know, being wined and dined and uh, listening to lobbyists on private jets or traveling to, uh, you know, an island hopping excursion in Indonesia on, uh, you know, some rich donor's dime. Unfortunately for us, uh, post Watergate, we didn't uh, actually require very much of the Supreme Court justices except, except disclosure. And he has failed to disclose. Hence, we need to have some sort of an ethics hearing about why he's embarrassed or why he hid or why he didn't disclose. Is he just, oh, I don't know, absent-minded? Is he addled? Is he, does he have ADD? Does he forget when he's doing his tasks that he needs to complete them? You know, because if, if that's the case, we could, you know, put post-it notes while he's making decisions that will affect our lives for the rest of our lives. You know, he may may need to post it. But we need an ethics hearing, and they should have had one in Tennessee before they were expelled for exercising their free speech rights on the well of the House in in between debates on bills. It wasn't during the debate on anything, okay? But Clarence Thomas, my God, either it applies, uh, you know, to everyone uh, that everybody that does a bad thing gets expelled or it applies to no one. And this is how we got here. Okay, this is exactly how we got here. You know, it's interesting because they say, well, Generation Z is not going to tolerate being shot in school. Well, I'm glad you finally found your rallying cry issue. I'm glad you finally found an issue that literally gelled with your uh, demographic because forever my demographic has been begging you to vote and you don't you didn't show up my generation's been begging you to pay attention to illegally uh you know declared wars We've, we've been trying to get you to pay attention to torture. We've been trying to get you to pay attention to uh, 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 never-ending authorizations to spy through the Patriot Act or never-ending authorizations to wage war. We've been asking you for, for, for years now, for 20 years, to pay attention to campaign finance reform, to, to tell you that money is being funneled into state legislatures, money's being funneled into the House of Representatives, money's being funneled into the Senate, Money's being funneled into to select Supreme Court justices and bad things were going to happen to your freedom. Bad things were going to happen. You didn't want to hear it. You didn't want to show up to vote. You just didn't. And every every cycle we had to hear, oh, the young people aren't voting again. Oh, the, well, the old people will do it. I was a young person and I voted. So don't tell me, you know, it's just it's it's really gross. But OK, everybody's rallied around this gun thing. Good. Now understand how the gun thing became a thing. Money. Money. And the money bought the legislators. And the legislators bought the maps, the gerrymandered maps. The gerrymandered maps gave them uber over representation because it doesn't look like the country. You understand? There are more people on the side of, uh, you know, red flag laws or background checks or banning assault weapons outright or at least requiring safe storage for them than there are against, like in the 90s, for background checks, like 98%. But you can't get there from here. Why? Because the money allowed for the gerrymandered districts, which diluted everyone who agrees from each other. It separated us from each other so that we all agree, but we all vote in separate districts. And they did that just in case you ever showed up to vote, which you don't. 
And it really, it, it really makes me angry now because now I'm being lectured to. I'm being lectured to by, uh, you know, the, the, gen, the, the Gen Zs. How did you let this happen? Oh, bite me. You know, I, I'm glad you're here now. Let's do the stuff we need to do now. I'm glad finally something moved you to action. Something actually piqued your interest. Something like, uh, you know, keeping your life or privacy or not having your data sold to random, you know, no gooders uh, or, or to getting uh, scammed and hacked and having no place to go. Or to understanding, you know, uh, that you're not free to move about the country anymore. Or understanding you can't read a book. Well, we don't read books. Yeah, well, I do. Do that one for me. I'll do the guns for you. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's so much. We really, really went there. And we've been going there. But finally, I think everybody's here. We don't want to go there. Well, it's good that you're here. But just know they went there. And we need to go there, too. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. This is Stephanie Miller, and here's what you missed. <laughs> Hi, John. Happy M- Merry Arrestmas Week. Uh, uh, Merry every... Arrestmas Week. Happy indictment. Every... Happy Everett Corcoran has to testify before the grand jury today. When you screw up so bad, your lawyer has to testify against you. You're having a good week. Happy 18 days until E. Jean Carroll's trial arrives as well. Remember, it's not about the first president to be indicted. It's just about Trump's first indictment. Yes, it's very exciting. It's magical. Every yep. little girl and boy remembers the first indictment, their first Oh, indictment. it's so special that the first one was in New York. Can I tell you? Right? It just... I mean, listen, Jack Smith can have his way with him. Fonnie Willis can leave a desiccated husk of hairspray and spray tan. I'm just glad the first one, all 34 <laughs> counts, were right here in the city that couldn't be fooled by Donald Trump yeah. ever. Yeah, exactly. I said it's, yeah. it's fitting. The city that's known him the best, the longest, that yeah. hates him the most. He high- yeah. hightailed it out of there. Yeah. Yeah, I tailed it out of here. Don't forget, he lost not just New York City in the 2016 Republican primary. He lost his own district. Yeah, yeah. he lost Trump Tower in the Republican primary. Yeah. <laughs> but we, again, New Yorkers don't hate him. They just are on to him and have been since the early 90s. So Mike, it's... Michael Rappaport speaks for all of us when he says, get them. Hang on a second. I, I need that behind me. Yeah. Get the f- out of here, you disgusting animal. Get out of here. Oh, I love a good New York accent, don't you? Oh, I do, I do. Yeah, it was great to have Marge in our city. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's really, really exciting. There's the, the real case about it is, you know, can Alvin Bragg charge Donald Trump uh, for covering up crimes he hasn't been charged for? And this is what I've been talking about with all my guests this week on the show, Steph. Like, you know, Alvin Bragg can't prosecute Trump for federal election fraud, but he can prosecute him for trying to cover up federal election mm-hmm. fraud. Hear all this and more on the next Stephanie Miller Show. There are some who want to divide us to make a political point or turn a profit. Joe Biden just wants to get things done. In just two years, Joe Biden's done a lot. Biden brought both parties together to rebuild our roads and bridges and pass laws that lower the cost of prescription drugs, deliver clean drinking water, and bring manufacturing jobs back to America. President Biden knows we can get more done if we come together because Joe Biden's a president for all Americans. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1882. That was the day trade union leader and suffragist Rose Schneiderman was born. She arrived from Poland and settled in New York City with her family as a child. Her father died soon after, and Rose entered the workforce at the age of 13. She sewed caps and organized with the United States. Don't give up Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561 270 3844. 561 270 3844. $5 Good Friday, you bastards. I know, that's like a non sequitur. Those words should never be in a sentence together, but they are. They are, Blanche. They are. <laughs> 
right. Yeah, so it's uh, five dollar Good Friday, uh, you bastard, and I just need you to give five dollars repeatedly. So the whole idea of five dollar Friday is you can do five dollars. Most people can, but do it every month, and that gives us some uh, sense of where we're going uh, financially, and that's a good thing. So if you can do five dollars, do it on the uh, app. That the the, the um, text message thing that is the easiest way to do it. Okay, so if you type in FSTV and send it to 44321, 44321, put in the letters FSTV, then we'll send you a secure link. And on that link, you put in $5 and then you choose recurring, you're done. No muss, no fuss. Or if you like talking to a person, I'm not a phone gal, as you can tell, because tons of people sitting on that line right now. But uh, if you like the phone, 877-378-8669, that would be the number to dial. And you could talk to a real-life human being over there in Denver, Colorado, and you could thank them for their hard work uh, disseminating these shows to all the places it needs to go, to Apple TV, to DirecTV, to Dish Network, to Sling, to Roku. Uh, that's what they do over there. Uh, and thank them and give them the five bucks repeatedly. And uh, freespeech.org will work, too, if you like doing it. On the computer, freespeech.org. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, Patrick in California. Hi, Randy. Hey. I just wanted to say that um, Tennessee State Representative Justin Pearson and Justin uh, Jones. Jones, I think, are uh, both of them just, I mean, they're 27, for God's sake. But yeah. I think both of them are absolutely effing brilliant. And I think that they have the um, searing intellect, the um, compassion, the wisdom um, of both a modern-day Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And I, I just think that these two gentlemen are exactly the people we need in government to save our country, our constitution, and our democracy. And I love a quote that's attributed to Ellie Mistal. Um, Tennessee has now given the entire country an abject lesson on in CRT. Theory. That's right. That's right, my friend. I pulled it too. I thought it was just so illustrative of what is going on right now. Um, Everybody sees it now. Everybody knows it now. Everybody gets exactly what is going on. I love this. Institutional racism. That's what CRT is. It's a legal theory of institutionalized racism in banks with redlining and the law with this nine-tiered justice system. And now you see it in the Tennessee legislature where the money buys the map. The map actually dilutes our power. They get a supermajority, and this is what they use it for. That is is what they teach in, uh, you know, a critical race theory class. That's exactly what critical race theory is about. I just I just love these two gentlemen and, and um, many more that are out there who are just terrifying and scaring the living bejesus out of these white, pasty, fascist, mediocre men. You know, I had a I had a girl actually cancel her subscription with me because I refer to myself as a pasty white person and she said for some reason pasty really upsets her when we call white people pasty. I'm like <laughs> Uh, th that's what we are. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, but I agree with you. I, I, I think they're brilliant. I think that uh, Ellie Mistel was right. This is what he Tennessee said. Tennessee has now given the entire country an object lesson in critical race theory <laughs> better than any AP history course ever could have. Right? Yep, right. Everybody sees it now. Everybody knows it now. Everybody gets exactly what's going on. To Harry's point about the Supreme Court, any argument that this was about decorum or or, 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 or the House rules in Tennessee, um, that the Republicans took that argument off the table for the rest of us when they decided not to expel the white lady, but they did expel the two black men, right? So that, I think, opens them up to a legal challenge that's even more serious than how I thought it was going to roll three hours ago. <laughs> And it's not just that they expelled the two black young uh, men, but that they let the 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 sixty year old white lady who who admits, you know, she 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 has absolutely no illusions about why she was saved. Okay, she said, look, they they were expelled because they're young, brilliant black men who will not bow down. They are brilliant. They are committed to their constituents and their communities. They're good people. They're smart people. And uh, they they got a lot of energy. And they're not going to take it. Why were those two expelled and you weren't? Well, I think it's pretty clear. I'm 
a six-year-old white woman, <laughs> and they are two young black men. I, I, in listening to the questions and the way they were questioned and the way they were talked to, mm. um, I was talked down to as a woman, mansplained to, mm -hmm. but it was completely different from the questioning that they got. It was. I don't know if you heard any of the questioning. I pulled some of it because you, you, if you didn't hear it, you wouldn't even believe that this was the tone and the tenor of uh, the, 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 the inquisition that these uh, young men had to go through. These elected representatives who collectively represent 78,000 people. OK, uh, I mean, some of them accused th they were being uh, persecuted. Right. They were being literally publicly lynched by a supermajority of white men in the Tennessee legislature in the House, and then they accused them of doing their own crime, of committing their own crime against themselves. I, 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 you, you, I mean, it's like your, your skirt was too short. What did you think was going to happen? Do you know it was that? The representative's address was a compelling, eloquent statement of why he needs to be expelled. What? In fact, when you listen to it carefully and closely, it's clear that he wants to be expelled. That's why he refers to all of you as a dishonorable house. We all saw the video of what he did. <laughs> he and two other representatives effectively conducted a mutiny, a mutiny. on March the 30th of 2023 in this very chamber. You hear the crowd. Recall that in his opening statement, he called his actions honorable. What that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that the gentleman shows no remorse. He does not even recognize that what he did was wrong. Oh my God. So not to expel him would simply invite him and his colleagues to continue to engage in mutiny on the House floor. A mutiny which to this, this body and to this state has been unknown in its 227 year history since we adopted our constitution in 1796. He's so full of crap, there are bullet holes in the Tennessee legislature. There, there's literally bullet holes. They, they fought duels in that chamber. I don't know what this man, but he was the sponsor of the expulsion uh, motion, okay? That was, uh, that was, his name's Gino Bolso over here. Gino. Yo, ho, oh, hey, yo, Gino. Uh, and Justin Jones was like, what? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I didn't hear a question, but while my <laughs> colleague's statement were, was, was eloquent, what he was essentially saying was that Justin is an uppity Negro. <laughs> How dare he point at the speaker and call a lie a lie. How dare he treat, act like he's your equal? How dare he come before this body and not bow down? That's what Representative Bolso was saying, and that's what he told me on the elevator two days ago when he tried to incite violence against me oh and got God. in my face and said, you are a damn disgrace. Oh my God. And I said, Representative Bolso, hold on, let me pull up my phone. Can you say that again? And he cowered and chose not to repeat it because he did not want the world to see what a disgrace he is for Williamson County voters. Damn, so he, this Bolso guy, this Gino, Gino Bolso, oh, yo, uh, the one that actually drafted the expulsion uh, resolution, had confronted Justin Jones in an elevator a couple days before and told him, called him a, a, a effing disgrace, an effing disgrace. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Trump isn't back. He never left. He picked Kevin McCarthy as his speaker. He owns the Republican Party, and his minions run the show. Hell, he's even back on social media. He's coming. 
You think a few liberal Republican billionaires are going to change MAGA's mind? Or weak D.C. consultants? We, in the end, will win. For all the noise about other Republicans, you know the truth. He's going to do what he did in 2016. Destroy his Republican opponents one by one. Little Marco. Even this guy. Maybe especially this guy. Ron DeSanctimonious. The lies. The disgusting insults. Blood coming out of her wherever. The racial provocations. Look at my African American. It's all coming back. And it's time to choose once again. Where do you stand? For America or Trump? I do want always corruption. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kiev. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kiev, and I can report Kiev stands strong. It stands tall, and most important, it stands free. Freedom. There is no sweeter word than freedom. There is no nobler goal than freedom. There's no higher aspiration than freedom. And all that we do now must be done so our children and grandchildren will know it as well. Freedom. Let us move forward with a abiding commitment to be allies, not of darkness, but of light, not of oppression, but of liberation, not of captivity, but yes, of freedom. May God bless you all. And may God bless the heroes of Ukraine and all those who defend freedom around the world. Last week, we sent a questionnaire to every Republican presidential candidate asking about Ukraine. And maybe the most newsworthy response that we received was from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Quote, while the U.S. has many vital national interests, DeSantis writes, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute is not one of them. The Republican backlash to DeSantis calling it a territorial dispute when Russia invaded Ukraine was immediate. This is not a territorial conflict, this war of aggression. I just think that's a misunderstanding of the situation. It's not a territorial dispute any more than it would be a territorial dispute if the United States decided that it wanted to invade Canada. This is a chance to stop Putin before it gets to be a bigger war, and China's watching. Just because someone claims something doesn't mean it, it belongs to them. This is an invasion. If you don't get that, you're not listening to what he's saying. You know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. Excited to see members of Congress incite violence against law enforcement, enjoy armed insurrections, and the big lie? If so, thank a mega Republican. If you think election results should only count when Republicans win, thank a mega Republican today. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. I have to concede one point. Today's far-right Republican Party does not discriminate against women. In fact, the GOP is giving its female political buffoons a higher profile than its male bozos. And lawmakers exclaim that the answer to America's so-called labor shortage is not to make jobs more attractive, but to fill them with cheap, compliant children. Fatality. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Charles and I are sitting here in New York City, where I don't think our audience has a deep or clear enough understanding of what you're experiencing there. Just saying to us in passing, you're in the elevator and a colleague is calling you an effing disgrace. Explain to us what it is like day in and day out working with those Republican colleagues, because it's shocking for us to hear this and we need to understand it. 
I mean, you saw some of it in the hearing today. I had a colleague tell me, um, Representative Kumar, that I should be grateful to be there, basically, huh. um, that, you know, I should I should become one of them. I should assimilate. Um, I had another you know, colleague tell me that how dare you call out the speaker? You know, he has no respect for our, our speaker because I called the speaker a liar when he said that that protest was an insurrection and put the lives of these young people in danger. Just a few weeks ago, we had a member, Representative Paul Sherrill, go on committee and say we should bring back lynching. He said we should bring back hanging by a tree the death penalty here by hanging by a tree and laughed and smirked about it. I mean, this is the, this is the body where we had a, a statue of the KKK that every time you pass into the House chamber, you pass a statue of the first KKK grand wizard. And, and we finally got that removed. You know, this body is a body where I have a history of good trouble. I was arrested here 14 times as a community organizer, fighting for racial justice, fighting for my community. And that's why when, we, when I became a lawmaker, they were so angry because, you know, they spent so much time trying to, to, to lock me out, to silence our movement, that when I became a member and had to sit on committees with them and they couldn't shut off the microphone, or they shouldn't have been able to, they still did. Um, it just, mm. it enraged them because to them, um, we are not equal. To them in the South, we still are separate and unequal and not worthy of even being in this place that we call the people's house. It is a very toxic environment. White supremacy is real here in Tennessee. This is the birthplace of the Klan, um, but it's also the, the birthplace of a movement of civil rights with people like Diane Nash and John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. And so we have that dual history here. And we want to stand in that other legacy of young people, young black people challenging this white terror that has defined uh, the South for too long. Unbelievable. I mean, uh, it's about time that uh, people actually picked up the John Lewis mantle, which was picked up by Martin Luther King Jr., which was picked up before him with, uh, you know, uh, 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 Booker and, and Tubman and a whole host of people uh, that worked for equality, worked for justice, worked for, you know, uh, the ability to be free, to move freely about the country, to not, uh, you know, be hunted down by slave patrols. OK, I mean, and, and it's all coming back. I mean, we got the Florida governor who's got his own slave patrol. He's got his own little militia now. He just funded it with like I, I, like a hundred million dollars, literally funding his own personal militia that isn't answerable to anybody but him. Doesn't answer to the feds. Uh, isn't it, it, you can't even question like what this militia does or, or what they don't do or, you know, whether or not they did they end up hurting somebody or shooting somebody or, you know, driving their car into somebody. We, there's no recourse. There's no recourse. This is what they're building. They're building, a, you know, like a Stasi. They're building a secret police. They're building. And that's not so secret. And this kid and, and, and the others, uh, you know, that joined him in this, uh, you know, uh, this quest for justice this quest to exert his own duly elected voice to, to advocate for his constituents caused him to be expelled? Well, I, I got an issue. They'll be back on Monday. They will because their city councils get to vote for an interim member of the House. Because right now, you got 78,000 Tennesseans with no representation in the legislature. They literally have no representatives. It's just stunning. But on Monday, uh, their city councils will vote for interim members, and I'm sure that they will choose Jones and Pearson to go be the interim members to fill their own seats that they won just recently in an election we just had. And they'll be back on Monday. They'll be able to stay in those seats until the next election, uh, which will be in 2024, and I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, uh, Shelby County and Nashville uh, will vote them back into office because they have done nothing but talk about democracy and how it's failing. They didn't make it personal. They didn't threaten anybody. They didn't, uh, you know, uh, say this or that or, or claim any affront or offense personally. They talked about democracy and how it is withering on the vine. They talked about equal justice. They talked about, uh, you know, being an elected official. They talked about uh, uh, the, the, the idea that, that they didn't even go through their own process. There was no ethics committee. There was no reprimand. There was no uh, censure. There was no taking down of words preceding an expulsion. They went all the way. They went from zero to 60 in 1.2 seconds. And, you know, they're not stupid kids. These kids, I, I shouldn't even call them kids. They're, easy, they're grown men. He's 27 years old. Seems young, but he's 27 years old. He's been an activist. 
his entire life. He went to Fisk University. Highly educated, highly skilled, highly compassionate, and highly responsive to his constituents. And he said, let's talk about expulsion. What the hell's going on here? Let's talk about expulsion. For years, one of your colleagues who was an admitted child molester sat in this chamber. No expulsion. Mm. One member sits in this chamber who was found guilty of domestic violence. No expulsion. We had a former speaker sit in this chamber who is now under federal investigation. No expulsion. We have a member still under federal investigation. No expulsion. We had a member pee in another member's chair in this chamber. Peed in a chair. No expulsion. Oh my God. In fact, they're in leadership. But in the, in the governor's administration. They're in leadership. So once again, what you're saying to us, since you're trying to put us on trial, I'll say what you're really putting on trial is the state of Tennessee. That's it. What you're really showing for the world is holding up a mirror to a state that is going back to some dark, dark roots. Mm. A state in which the Ku Klux Klan was founded is now attempting another power grab by silencing the two youngest black representatives and one of the only women, democratic women in this body. That's what this is about. Let us be real today. Let us be real today, and, and why? because they are tired of gun violence? That's the issue, that's the hill that these Republican supermajority members, that uh, leadership in the governor's administration is peeing on people's seats? This is the hill they chose to die on? The, the, the hill where, where we say, can you please protect the school children? Can you please stop uh, the, the wholesale slaughter of Tennesseans? Can you please protect Nine-year-olds? When they're in school? No, no, we can't, we won't. And in fact, you're going on trial. What? Really sad. Brother David. Oh, my. Well, sister, um, hog some Pesach, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, and happy $5 Good Friday chat room. Hi, chat room, you know what to do. RandyRoads.substack.com or freespeech.org, et cetera. Um, it's funny. There's nothing funny about it. But one, the two Justins are definitely going back on Monday. Yeah. Uh, there, there's no way they won't. Um, but they've already gone beyond by the coverage this is getting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> boom. I think history, if we still have an arc of history to look back, it's going to see this as quite a turning point this week. Um, yeah, because, you never yeah. know what the spark that lights the fire in the belly is going to be. And I have a funny feeling that this is the spark, which is why we're not ignoring it, which is why we're fanning it, which is exactly. why I want it out there. I want it, uh, you know, uh, lifted. Precisely. I want it exalted to the level of outrage that is required here to for that, a response. Cause that the, it merits and then some. Yeah, I the mean, other, listen, they went there, and now finally everyone is here. Yay, welcome. Yeah. But we need to go there. And that's, that cool. in case people don't know, what is next? We go there. Yeah. The other thing is today is the anniversary of the 1949 opening of South Pacific on Broadway. <laughs> and I didn't know that. But when I was watching the expulsion test, you know, the, the boat coming down, I kept thinking, you've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught, etc." cetera. Good one. That song could have been written this morning. And since they're trying to unteach so much, this is what we're doing. We're Look, this is more than a teachable moment. This is a moment of action. It is. It is. And there, there you have it. Have a fabulous weekend, darling. Thank you. Happy Good Friday. Happy Easter to you. I gotcha. Oh, thank you. Mwah. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I don't know, yeah, but he's right. He picked the right uh, the right song from that particular play. Anyway, think about it, plan about it. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes.
Sandyroads.com. Nine one one. What's your emergency? America's healthcare system is broken, and people are dying. Welcome to Code Whack, where we shine a light on America's callous healthcare system, how it hurts us, and what we can do about it. I'm your host, Brenda Gazar. This time on Code Whack. How does diversity in politics affect the policies that impact our everyday lives? What challenges do women face when running for office? And once they get there, how do their life experiences influence their political work? To find out, we spoke to California Assemblywoman Pilar Schiavo. It really is so important to have diversity in your legislature and any decision-making body, right? And you see that in our women's caucus where, you know, we're really prioritizing women and children child care is an affordable child care is a huge priority for us as a caucus. I can't imagine any other caucus or group of folks in Sacramento really prioritizing that if it's not women. And just things like that, the Women's Caucus is the one who's, you know, sponsoring these 17 bills around reproductive rights and justice and health care. Women who have these kinds of frontline experiences know what it's like to experience pay inequity or harassment in the workplace or sexual violence attacks on bodily autonomy, having those firsthand experiences and then going to Sacramento and having an opportunity to make policy and shape policy to address those issues, I think is critical and it's really exciting. Let's get the full Code Wax story on ProgressiveVoices.com and on the PV app. Catch all our episodes by subscribing to Code Wack wherever you find your podcasts. This podcast is powered by Heal California, a nonprofit that uplifts the voices of those fighting for healthcare reform around the country. Until next time, stay healthy. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. I think you have to ask yourself, who are they hurting with this? And they clearly think they're hurting President Biden. Oil prices spike after OPEC announces surprise production cuts. Good news, bad news with California's record snowpack. Plus... You know, we're seeing it as a boom for American innovation. American industry is good for the planet as well. Biden administration boosts clean energy and clean manufacturing, cracks down on toxic mercury and lead water pipes. Well, they're busy. All of those stories and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. Over the weekend, hundreds of cases of beer spilled on a Montana train derailment. The train spilled hundreds of cases of beer into this local river, including a whole bunch of Coors Light. But authorities say the water is fine, and so is the river. (laughs) Coors Light Slam.